Hello, sinners. I just wanted to drop in and tell you that My Horror Confessional is now part of the Ghoulish Podcast Network. In addition to producing podcasts, Ghoulish is also a publisher. Ghoulish Books has published dozens of horror books that have gone on to receive award recognition and even film adaptation treatments. Browse their spooky offerings over at ghoulish.rip and use discount code CONFESSIONAL for 10% off your order. And remember, ghouls, live spooky, die spooky. Hello, everyone. My name is Miguel Myers. Welcome to My Horror Confessional, where every week I'll have a guest come on and talk about one classic horror movie that they haven't seen and why. We'll discuss the movie, the actors, and probably get off topic quite a bit. Once I believe they are properly atoned, I will absolve them of their horror movie sin. Today, we have returning guest Jessica McHugh. Jessica is a three times Bram Stoker Award nominated poet, a multi genre novelist, and an internationally produced playwright who spends her days surrounded by artistic inspiration at a Maryland tattoo shop. She's had 30 books published in 15 years, including her Elgin Award-nominated Blackout Poetry Collection, A Complex Accident of Life. Her sci-fi bizarre romp, um, sorry, her sci-fi bizarre romp, The Green Kangaroos, and her cross-generational horror series, The Gardening Guidebooks Trilogy, explore the growing worlds of Jessica McHugh at McHughUniverse.com. <laughs> best um website name ever <laughs> thank you <laughs> yeah well just go welcome to back to the show thank you so much for having me i'm excited to be here and talk about this um <clears throat> film <laughs> <laughs> i i'm so happy you chose this movie one because you know i enjoy it but it's been a while since i saw it uh and of course uh we're talking about summer party massacre and we'll, we'll get to it in a second but um the reason why is because i'm so excited that you chose it is for the last Two, two out of three weeks, I did I Spit on Your Grave, and then I did The Devils, which okay. are both deal with, uh, you know, yeah. a lot of stuff. And I don't want to get into it because I don't want to have to do a trigger warning on this one because <laughs> I've done trigger warnings in the last two. Following up that with The Slumber Party Massacre, which is basically, you know, popcorn theater sort of stuff. Yeah. Uh, it was great. So, yeah. So, but you last time you were on, we talked about The People Under the Stairs, and that's yeah. been about year and a half ago probably two years ago yeah um, i'm since... so glad you watched that like, yeah it, it was such a great movie and i was scared of it for so long and... <laughs> you know i remember like every now and then i just remember that story you told me about the billboard <laughs> yeah. it seems so silly now like i wish i could go back in time and be like you're scared of a billboard yeah. like maybe it's fun so people if you haven't heard it uh the episode jessica's a great guest and it's a funny uh, great story. So I'm actually going to tell you guys to go listen to that episode. Um, she was one of the first guests to head on and it's always uh, just so much fun. So since since we've talked, obviously you are uh, you always working on something. So what are you working on right now? Um, right now I am finishing the, the third book in the Gardening Guy books trilogy. Um, it'll be out next year from Ghoulish Books, and that one is Witches in the Warren. It's a 1982 glam rock horror novel, and it is um, it's wild. It's 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 perfect, like kind of 80s trash gore, like super fun time. And I think it's good. I think people are going to enjoy the way I'm tying up the trilogy. Um, I'm also working on uh, my new Blackout Poetry Collection, and it is erotic horror inspired by Wuthering Heights. So <laughs> and it's cool. I'm writing it in a play format as well. So it's just going to be a very theatrical, gross, good time. <laughs> and so, so you're talking about your blackout poetry. I recall because I follow you on Instagram. Um, and I recall within fairly recently, maybe it was within a year or so, there was somebody that came out against blackout poetry and then you you and like the your um the people around you were like what the hell are you talking about blackout poetry is is great and cool 
Well, yeah. Can you? Can you? We don't need to name names, and if it's and if it's something you want to talk about, that's fine as well. But I was just curious, what, what, what was that about? Um. Yeah. I. I honestly, I don't even remember the the person who said it. Um. You know, it it comes up every every once in a while. Someone's just like, uh, blackout poetry is like lazy or it's not art because you're just, you know, using words that are already there and whatever. And um, I, I mean, I think in some ways, blackout poetry is uh, incredibly difficult because you only have the words in front of you and the letters in front of you. I mean, when you're, when you're writing any kind of uh, anything from scratch, you have every word in existence and every language in existence. You have, you know, the, the, the sky is not the limit. In, in blackout poetry, there's a very clear limit yeah. of what you can use. Um, but yeah, no, it was it was just silly. It's it's you know, it's art is subjective, and you know, obviously, it's not every kind of art is going to be for everybody. So uh, yeah, it was just someone expressing their opinion. Uh, myself and a lot of other people that disagreed with that yeah. opinion, and so uh, when they tweeted this thing everyone just started making blackout poetry from it so it was, <laughs> well that's right yeah, it's just oh like my god thing. that was so good that and so i mean good. and that's that's what's great because uh i mean like i said you can use the words in front of you but you can also just use letters to build stuff you can go different directions you can go all over the page and it's you know it's 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 a lot of fun and anyone who thinks it's like not art or lazy just hasn't uh explored it enough i don't yeah. think all right so forgetting her that negative part of what 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 is it about blackout poetry that draws you to it? and then i have a follow-up question about like how you go about doing it but first i i do want to hear like what what is it that draws you to blackout poetry yeah absolutely so blackout poetry is essentially finding a poem hidden within a larger piece of prose so you're taking an existing piece of text. I mean, it, you could write blackout poetry from poetry or, you know, plays or a VCR instruction manual, like anything that you have. Um, but yeah, it's just finding a little hidden poem or you could think of it as flash fiction as well. Uh, finding something hidden inside and then using art in whatever context you wish to black out, quote unquote, the superfluous text. So, you know, that can be as uh, simple as just crossing out the words you don't need. Um, it could be as complex as, you know, removing the ink from the page using pieces of tape or something like that, or, you know, making a sculptural piece even. So it's really up to the person. Um, for me, like when I'm writing, you know, when you're writing and you like, you write the perfect line, you're like, oh damn, I am good. Like, you know, that moment, that's every time I write a black album. <laughs> like the the payoff for me emotionally is is just um, really really high, and it's um, like three or threefold. You know, I get to I find a poem. I you know I kind of perfect it a little bit because you know there there really is when you're thinking about using the art later. You know, you maybe write the initial poem. And you're like, oh, maybe choosing this the over here you know i know people can't see where i'm pointing it's <laughs> not everyone they can, can, they can on the patreon yes, on the patreon yeah, patreon.com yeah. slash my horror profession <laughs> um so you know there's a way to almost sculpt the words to aid the artwork you're going to be doing later so um you you write the poem you, it's beautiful great then you get to add the art even cooler then maybe you publish it. Yay, I published a poem. Or you sell it to somebody on a commission. Now someone has it up on their wall. You know, for me, that's that's the joy I, I get from it is all those things. But the main thing is just finding this, this really cool turn of phrase um, hidden within another writer's vocabulary, which is so fun to play in because it's like, it's it's like playing in a playground that isn't your own as far as you come to you know, your own pieces with your own vocabulary. And then then you get to see how often Louisa May Alcott liked using the word buttonhole for some reason. <laughs> but yeah. so it, for me, it's it's just fun. It's it's a lot of fun. And um, yeah, and that's why I'm, that's why I write. <laughs> is it uh, a- <laughs> Why I do any kind of art, cause it's fun. Yeah, is it like uh, unlocking uh, 
some sort of like a puzzle is it like a puzzle it that you just feels like that yeah. sometimes totally yeah. I and I mean, there there are different ways where I do it where you know I kind of just sit there and it's almost like you know one of those a stereogram like the magic eye yeah, like yeah, sometimes yeah. like it'll, it'll just pop out at me and like I there really isn't that much like effort involved as far as trying to create it I'm like oh that's the hidden poem in here um or I can approach it where I'm like, I'm looking for a poem to do this, you know, so I actually really try to use the words and letters to create the the feeling I want. And I, I do that a lot more with like commissions, because I always ask for, you know, is you, do you have a theme in mind? You know, some people want like, you know, gory horror from Charlotte's Web, or they want a romantic poem from uh, Where the Red Fern Grows, which was fun. Um, and, and, uh, and, you know, you, you start to look for the words that are in that kind of milieu of like love and that kind of stuff. And then you, I, I start to craft something very specific based on that rather than just kind of allowing it to, I was going to say come upon me, but I don't know, <laughs> I don't know if that's the, sometimes it feels like that when you're making yeah. art. <laughs> so, um, I guess. So kind of following up with that, how, how is I guess when it's a commission, you you know what you're what you're gonna be working with, like if they ask for a specific book or something like that. But when you're writing for yourself, are you creating for yourself? How do you how do you choose perhaps the work that you're gonna be looking at or the particular page? Like, are you gonna going by page by page, or do you like how, how does that how does the process of creation work? Um, so basically when I'm doing a collection, um, you know, I've been doing kind of very specific, um, classic, uh, books written by women. So that's kind of how I've been going along with those. But, uh, as far as like, just kind of making something for myself that I may, you know, just sell at a, um, a festival or something like that, I really will just pick up one of the books I have, just open it to a random page, um, see if any words pop out at me I'll maybe spend like a minute or two waiting for like words to pop out I kind of see it as like you know it's just like a sea endless sea of words and then there are these little like buoys of words that just float up and mm, okay. kind of, uh so I'll spend a couple minutes just kind of looking I'll look top to bottom, left to right, I'll look right to left, I'll look bottom to top to see if anything pops out. And if it doesn't, I move right on. Like, because it just may not be, um, I'm, I might just not be in the the headspace to see whatever's on that page. Um, I, I feel that when I did Frankenstein and that was my first blackout poetry collection, um, I didn't find anything in Frankenstein. Like I, I had no intention to make a collection from it because it was not working for me at all. Um, and then one day I picked it up and I saw everything. Mm, okay. So um, I don't know if it was just the headspace, but yeah, I'll spend just a couple minutes looking at a page and if nothing happens, I just move right on. And uh, really it's just looking for one or two words to pop out. And then once I, I feel like I have a good word to like anchor onto, I'll start to like look around it and be like, okay, can, can I take this somewhere? Um, you know, kind of up and down the page. And it's like, will this lead me into a complete thought? Um, what's so great about, uh, what I really love about Blackout Poetry is using metaphor and simile. And I think it's so interesting um, on the page, you can often find so many great like connecting metaphors, especially with something, and we're, with Wuthering Heights right now, I had no idea Wuthering Heights had so much food, like imagery in it. Like it's it's very food heavy. So. The, the collection I'm working is, is called Feast. And there is just so much like on every page, just weird food stuff with forks and knives. And it's just, I, I again, another one where I was like, I don't, I wasn't gonna write an erotic horror collection from Wuthering Heights, but like Wuthering Heights was like, yeah, this is what I need to be. <laughs> because it's so funny. <laughs> Cause like you, you could just be, be creating you're creating this blackout poetry and perhaps it wasn't what the author was thinking, whatever, but also sometimes you could be getting into the psyche right. of the author, you know, and without them even knowing it. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think that's kind of what's really great about it is if you do a collection or if I've, I've had authors send me their books to make blackout poetry from, you can really distill it down to its 
to its themes and like, yeah, some of the, the motivation kind of behind that. It's really interesting. And I feel, I feel like that's why um, each of my Blackout Poetry collections, it does say something on a, on some level about the original book. Um, it, it's a commentary on certainly The Quiet Ways I Destroy You with Little Women, um, Strange Nest from Secret Garden. I had no, I did not remember that Secret Garden was such a depressing uh, book about like grief and transformation and stuff. And I mean, that's, that's what that collection was because I was writing it while I was grieving. So I mean, it, it is really interesting that you you get to the real essence of, of a book and also you find out the author's favorite words. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll say one thing, uh, the Bible. Have you blacked out the Bible? <laughs> I have done the Bible. You have? Oh my yeah. God, that's amazing. Um, my dear friend, Jay Wilburn, may he rest, yes. in, peace. rest um, in peace. Jay. Yeah, he, he commissioned me to do the Bible. Um, I think I did like 10 pieces or something. And yeah, I, it was, it was so fun to work with. He had very specific um, uh, parts of the Bible. He wanted me to make stuff from, and I ended up getting, I think three different copies and use them all. And, and I was really worried because I was like, oh my God, how are these pages going to take paint and colored pencil and all that kind of stuff? Very well, actually. <laughs> Very cool. Very it, cool. Yeah, I made some really beautiful pieces, and yeah. So, um, speaking of like selling your commission and your work and all that sort of stuff, you are uh, a featured ghoul at the Ghoulish Book Festival. Yeah, um, so coming excited. up in like we're we're less than two weeks away at this yeah. point, I think, uh, March fifteenth, sixteenth, and seventeenth in downtown San Antonio. Um, if people are interested, uh, you can purchase your badges on uh, ghoulish.rip and uh, uh, yourself, uh, and RJ Joseph, and uh, just some other, uh, Daniel Krause mm -hmm. are the ghouls of honor for, for this year. I mean, you and Daniel Krause and RJ Joseph, like what, <laughs> uh, what a lineup. It's just, I know it's going to be so much fun. I'm really, really excited. Yes. And I feel like I, I just saw them in, in November. So I'm just like, you know, it's like getting to see your friends at summer camp and, you know, yeah. it's great. I really look forward to Ghoulish Book Festival every year. Uh, and so this year, like I said, you are a featured ghoul. Um, and so you're going to be obviously selling your wares, reading, uh, selling your works, I should say, and readings and doing stuff like that. How can people follow you and support you ex besides going to Ghoulish Book Festival? How <laughs> else can they purchase your work? Um, you can always uh, hit me up online. I'm at the Jess McHugh pretty much everywhere. Instagram and I, well, all the places, basically. <laughs> all the new places, all the old places. Um, and uh, McHughUniverse.com is my website. You can always reach me through there. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm everywhere, I feel like. <laughs> Are you open for commissions right now? Um, I, I am. Yeah, I am open for commissions. Uh, I just finished up a whole bunch and I was like, kind of <sighs> like taking a little break, but I mean, I'm always open for commissions. Okay. I love doing it. So it's, it's a lot of fun. So yeah, you can hit me up on there and I, I have on hand books and you can request a book and yep, I'll do it. Have all. you kind of cannibalized and done your own work? A blackout I, poetry with your own work? So I haven't made it like a full poem from any of my work yet but i um there so the third book in in the gardening guidebooks trilogy has a band in it and it's a, a touring band and so i basically am writing or have written all of the band's songs by making blackout poems from the second book hairs in the hedgerow so <laughs> it's genius and i love it and i can't that's, wait that's to as it. far as i've gone i haven't actually made the pieces yet i'm hoping to make a sort of like diary um thing that maybe we can do supplementally you know when the third book comes out that's the band oh okay yeah, kind yeah. Of notebook of songs so yeah. um yes but we'll see it's it was interesting i you know i definitely found my favorite words too when i was doing <laughs> it i was like wow there was blood like six times on this page <laughs> yeah that's cool that's a, it's one of the best words yeah. Uh, okay. Well, everybody, go and uh, follow Jessica. Support her. Um, buy her books. Buy uh, you know uh, commission her. Um, come let come meet her at a Ghoulish Book Festival again, March fifteenth, sixteenth, and seventeenth in uh, downtown San Antonio. 
So uh, today you are here to confess your horror sin of never having watched Slumber Party Massacre from 1982. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. The year and, was born. See, same, same as you was born as well. Um, <laughs> and there's some information on some of the actresses and that um, I, I can't wait to get into um, that have been that have been doing it since, since 1982. But how did this particular movie pass you by? Is it one that you never heard of, or you just kind of stayed away from it? Yeah, I just, I just never, I guess it just never appealed to me in a way where I was just like, I need to see that. Like I had never heard anything crazy mm. about my, my husband has, has seen both of them, but he's always talking about the second one. Yes. Like, and I want to talk to you about that. <laughs> okay. And I haven't, I haven't watched it yet, but okay. he's like, you have to. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, I, I feel, I mean, first of all, if the name Slumber Party Massacre doesn't just draw you in immediately, then I then I can understand it. perhaps it, it uh, uh, might not be for you, or you maybe just weren't interested in, in watching at the time. Um, but, uh, so let's get into just talking about the movie here. Um, but, but first, I, I'm sorry, I wanted to see 100 episodes and still messing up. Uh, it, this movie was uh, directed by Amy Holden Jones. Um, so she went on to, this was her first movie that she directed. Um, she went on to direct, I think, three other movies, uh, two of them, including Made to Order and The Rich Man's Wife. But she created and wrote a TV show on, on, that was on Fox up until 2023, I believe, called The Resident, which had 107 episodes and went for five years. Um, and then she wrote The Relic and the original Beethoven. What? <laughs> Beethoven the Dog movie. <laughs> Which went on to like have five sequels. She yeah. didn't write those or anything like that. Uh, but she did write Mystic Pizza. Okay. If you have ever seen Mystic Pizza, Mystic Pizza is a good movie. Okay. Yeah. I definitely looked up stuff because I think I got maybe like 10 minutes in this movie. And I was like, wrote and directed this. <laughs> and then and then found out like kind of the whole backstory kind of of it. And I was like, okay. <laughs> yeah, people are uh, people would be surprised uh, to learn that a woman uh, wrote and directed uh, the film, uh, or two women wrote yeah. and directed, you know, I'm trying to say the, the film. Um, and then, but in, there's a story, like, it sounds like you, you've already heard about that, uh, why people would, wouldn't think that a woman directed this film, but, and we'll get that to that in a second, but she was originally a film editor and she wanted to direct and, and asked one of her friends who was a writer, Francis Dole, um, that was associated with Roger Corman for advice. And we, we've gone into um, in the past episodes, I've gone into Roger Corman. Um, the man is like the B movie King, um, regardless of whether or not he's skeezy and kind of scummy. Um, he was, he's made, uh, I believe almost produced almost 400 films and directed over 40 of them. Um, so he was a force. Uh, it's still alive at almost 98 years old. Uh, but um, so she asked her friend for help um, or for advice, and her friend said, or, or her friend gave her a bunch of uh, a number of scripts, and so she read through them, and she came across the Slumber Party Massacre, then going by the title "Don't Open the Door," and she decided to film the first three scenes herself. So her husband, uh, who was a cinematographer, Michael Chapman, he acquired equipment and film and hired actors from the University of California. And then they shot the scenes at their house over a weekend for about a, like a thousand dollars. She then took that and showed the result to Roger Corman, who agreed to finance the film. And she had to actually turn down an editing job on ET to do this movie. So <laughs> like, I love that, that she wanted something so bad. She, she went out and made it for herself mm -hmm. and she was successful in one field and uh, she, I mean, E.T. is one of the biggest movies ever. And she had the opportunity to work on that and turned it down to create something of her own, which worked out for her because it was her first directing film, uh, directing job. She went on to do three others, but she produced a bunch more and, and wrote a bunch more. She's still active right now. So I think it really worked out in her favor. Good on her. Yeah. Of, of the criticism of the movie, which there is a lot and I have a lot and I'm sure you'll have a lot as well. She she um, is talking about people who complain that she's a sellout to her gender as a woman who produced an exploitation flick with a lot of naked girls in it. She says, that's what Roger Corman, the producer, wanted, and that's how it's done. You give the studio what they want. 
Nobody complains that Scorsese, Jonathan Demme, and Ron Howard met, made exploitation pictures, but when a woman tries, she gets called a hypocrite and a turncoat. That's BS. So that's her thoughts on the movie. Obviously, it doesn't, um, you know, everybody can have their own thoughts on it, but that's what uh, she was thinking. Uh, now, this was also written by a woman, Rita Mae Brown. Are you familiar with Rita Mae Brown at all? I, I don't really, except that I, I saw that she's uh, from Hanover, PA, which is not far from where I grew up. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah. So she was uh, an American feminist writer, best known for her coming of age autobiographical novel, Ruby Fruit Jungle, which is in one of the scenes in this movie in the background. <laughs> uh, but she uh, she was active in a number of civil rights campaigns and criticized the marginalization of lesbians within feminist groups. She received the Pioneer Award for Lifetime Achievement at the Lambda Literary Awards in 2015. Back in 1982, she wrote a screenplay parodying the slasher genre titled Sleepless Nights. It got into the hands of Roger Corman, and he retitled it The Slumber Party Massacre, and they decided to film it completely dead on as a slasher and taking on the parody uh, um, of the slasher genre. So taking that all that out made me when I when I read that like you know ten minutes into the movie I was like okay it, like I once I could see it from that point of view I was like okay yeah it's like <laughs> it's a it was written as a as a parody it was written by a feminist woman as a parody then we see it through the lens of producer Roger Corman who added all these naked women scenes and then also then it's filtered through an, a woman's lens the you know the the writer of the film or i'm sorry the director of the film amy holden jones so it's like meta? it's very interesting for sure <laughs> yeah but even with all that deepness it also doesn't go that deep the movie you know <laughs> I think like the making of the movie is is deeper than the movie. I, yeah, I can see that. I can yeah. see that. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so the the music, I, I what did you think of the music? Oh, you know what? I don't think I even like okay. took notice of the music. Weirdly. So I, I'm always listening because I love synth. Uh, okay. Synth score. This the composer was Ralph Jones, who is okay. Amy Holden's Jones brother so the director's brother Mm -hmm. he recorded the entire score on a small casio synthesizer i love that it's like so if you've ever like you ever see bob's burgers yeah gene like imagine gene is working on his casio making a score for a a i didn't even notice yeah i don't think i took any notes about the music yeah absolutely love it uh i I think i need to look up look the score up uh on the uh for, for a vinyl and so then it's star and the movie is starring Michelle Michaels. Uh, she plays Trish. Uh, she had some bit parts, but never really led a movie again, which is sad because I think she did a pretty good job here. She was all right. Yeah. Uh, Ro- it's also starring Robin Still, who was Valerie. She was in uh, Sorority Babes and the Slimeball Bolarama, the all time classic. All uh, right. And American Ninja 4, The Annihilation, which is the American Ninja uh, series. A franchise if you've never seen it no. it's over the top and completely ridiculous 80s ninja stuff it's so much fun um she uh so she had she was in a couple movies she unfortunately passed away at a very early early age um uh-huh. uh, so she you know wouldn't have too much from her uh deborah deliso as kim andre honoree mm-hmm. as jackie gina smika hunter as diane jennifer myers as courtney pamela roylance as coach jenna Brink Stevens as Linda. Now, Linda, I've never heard of Brink Stevens. And I've seen this movie before once, but mm-hmm. apparently, so she's a scream queen. She's been in 220 films and counting, including some of the ones that are called like Big Freaking Snake and <laughs> Meat, Hook Ma- Meat Hook Massacre 4. Right. But since 1982, she has had at least one movie come out every year up until and including 2024. Sometimes as much as 15 movies in one year. What? Who is Brink? Her name is Brink? Brink Stevens. Yeah, she is. uh, Apparently, so she got in with these two, like, cult direct, not cult as in bad, like, cult movie directors who, like, make, who are just, like, making movies, like, on a, 
like in a factory you're just making movies over and over and over again okay. and so she's a, this b movie scream queen over 220 films and in 2024 she already has like five movies coming out and we're in March. <laughs> it's absolutely crazy but i love it Bring the lifetime achievement award <laughs> my goodness and she's a writer and producer as well she wrote yeah. and starred in her own movie called teenage exorcist in the 90s Okay. So I just want to. I wanted to honor the women that were were in this yeah. movie. Um, Shout and, out to Brink and yeah. all the other hardworking ladies. And um, so the the uh, villain of the movie, played by Joseph Allen. No, I'm sorry, by Michael Vieja. Uh, he, um, he plays Russ Thorne, and uh, Joseph Allen Johnson uh, plays Neil. Now. I was yeah. I always try to like credit somebody if they have a notable movie or something like that. He didn't really have any notable movies, but he did have a movie called Hollywood Hot Tubs, and Hollywood Hot Tubs is about a young man who gets a job repairing hot tubs for the rich and famous. All right. In Tinseltown, as he moves from one bubbly tub to the next, sexual situations change accordingly. Yeah. So I mean, I had to so, had to shout that out. So we hopefully I might do it on a, a future episode. <laughs> I mean. Uh, yeah, and then uh, David Milburn uh, as Jeff. So this is a largely female cast of two dudes, or two, yeah, I will say three dudes, one in, uh, including the the killer. Mm-hmm. So it's, so that's a majority f- uh, woman cast. Uh, what did you think? Of, I, I, and the movie itself is, we'll get to that, but yeah. just having a majority uh, woman cast directed by a woman and written by a woman. I mean, I, I thought it was it was very interesting, especially after I, you know, I, I learned the kind of satire angle of the script. Um, I, I it made me wonder if like did, if the actresses and everything knew that and they were kind of like hamming it up a bit. I don't know, because it did feel very like wink, wink, you know, kind of at each other. Like we're just a bunch of crazy girls uh, just, you know, having fun topless. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> like, in, like walk around in negligees around I've your friends. Never friend. had a, a friend group that close knit in my entire <laughs> life, and I feel like I'm missing out. Um, no, it was it was great. It was it was a romp for sure. Um, yes. <laughs> but yeah, it was it was nice to nice to see uh, a big, a very uh, female led cast. Even if I could tell none of them apart you know yeah, <laughs> yeah. Any, i was just like who everyone looked 27 in brunette so yeah. i was <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, it, it was it was like you want to celebrate the fact that there's, there's a woman writer woman behind the oh, camera yeah. and then woman a cast but they're being made they're being made to do things by the producer mm-hmm. and stuff that's like necessary for like an 80s horror film so it's like it, it like you're like yay but also nay sort of thing so yeah, I, I, I yeah I mean, but it was it, yeah it's it doesn't bother me like you know i i like the the hanging out topless and whatnot for no reason yeah. um that's that's totally fine with me it's yeah it's the lingering like butt shots where i'm like is the butt the killer i don't <laughs> <laughs> like i do i need to remember this butt for later oh you know? yeah <laughs> like like is that a mole that i'm gonna need to recognize yeah exactly okay. <laughs> just okay. expect, yeah now now that you mentioned the music yeah i was like because i feel like there was a close-up of a butt and like the music was like sinister yeah like is this an evil butt? <laughs> yeah yeah well there's already a movie like the evil bong movie so maybe there you go bong. you never know you never yeah. know in an 80s movie it could be the ass <laughs> killer who knows yeah <laughs> All right, so let's get started talking about the movie. Um, the movie starts, there's like a, a blood red Slumber Party Massacre logo against the stark white backdrop, which I really, really dig. I want a t-shirt of that. I think that would look killer on just a white t-shirt. Um, and I, I noticed here, pretty cool, like the, the music already, I'm digging it. Uh, we see palm trees, it's a suburban home, so we kind of think it's like California or like West Coast or maybe, you know, um, Florida or something like that. Kids are riding in, on bikes. Uh, he's delivering newspapers. One of these newspapers we see mass murderer of five, Russ Thorne, escapes. So we already know something. Uh, we yep. might be seeing this character back. This, this is probably the early, the like earliest I've ever seen. I already know everything I need to know <laughs> about this movie. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. And this is the most like okay. Let's just get in talking about the killer because they 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 put it out in front street real quick. So yeah. we might as well. Mm-hmm. 
1982, no mask. Yeah. Uh, we know his name. Mm -hmm. We know who the killer is immediately. They don't try to hide it whatsoever. No, there's no building of suspense at all. It's like, here's our killer. Here's the people he's going to kill. Let's go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, it was a little refreshing because like, like okay, 1982, we're, we're in the heyday of the post-Halloween slasher boom, mm -hmm. right? Um, uh, I think uh, Friday, the mm -hmm. Friday the 13th is already out. Uh, the burning is already out. Uh, I think uh, Nightmare Now she comes out in two years, mm -hmm. but like heyday here, and we've seen like Sledgehammer, which is a shot on video movie that came out already. Already, so it's like masks, masks, mask, masked killer. We don't know who they are. We don't know why they're killing. And then here it's just like, oh no, he's killed before. This is how he looks. Yeah, um, this guy. He's not even like all that creepy looking. Like he's just like some dude. Just, just the most mid-looking dude uh, <laughs> ever. Uh, yes. <laughs> so, I, what did you think about the that choice for the killer? Did it do something I, for you, or did it kind of detract a bit? I mean, I just thought it was unexpected. Yeah. And, you know, I was just like, you know, like I said, there's nothing like, ooh, who's it gonna be? It's like it's this guy here's here's his address he's you know here's his driver's license yeah <laughs> yeah exactly you know? <laughs> um uh, no he was and, and you know in his choice of weapon is a choice um that he made uh oh, yeah. I don't know well, if that's because he's a madman or something i don't know um but yeah it was it was interesting how the movie's like let's just go let's get to it yeah <laughs> we, got our, we got our massacre set up and then you know, next next scene we get a slumber, so you know we're. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. The party well, is coming. Yeah, yeah. I was I was about to say there wasn't so much slumbering. She just had in bed, like the next scene. She's just like, ah. Yeah, that's true. That the slumber was in the beginning. Lives. We didn't yeah. say the slumbering and yeah. the partying was happening at the same time. Yeah, the slum exactly. First slumbering, yes, her, yeah, slumber, yeah, yeah. party. Those are three Very different good. things. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but. We do, uh, like you're saying, we do meet Trish. She's waking up. Um, she's our, well, she will be, uh, she's our heroine in this one, our main antagonist. Uh, who, we'll see if she'll be the final girl. Um, but uh, we hear a scream from a radio that she's listening to. The person has won a t-shirt. That was a like, funny little joke, you know, like, oh, did I win $100? Like, yeah. No, you won a t-shirt. Uh, Okay. I, I, mean, I just won a car wash like on yeah. the radio so i i sympathize i was like a car wash <laughs> you, oh you but you won i literally like, i won a car wash and i was like oh did you ever follow up on a car wash no i bet nobody ever does they just <laughs> no. like the next week it was movie tickets and i'm like Darn. <laughs> <laughs> so uh then uh, of course, uh, she has to get ready, so it wouldn't be an 80s horror movie without some breasts. Mm -hmm. As she does so, she uh, She takes puts some her childish things, because now she's a woman. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, like, <laughs> did she just turn, and, and I'm going to talk yeah. about the age in a second, but like, did she just turn 18 and she was like, okay, now I need to put this stuff away? Or is it because she knew she was going to be having a party and she didn't want her friends to see the, her toys, so maybe that's what it is? I, I wrote down Ah, good. The observe your breasts, then put away childish, childish things. Part of growing up, yeah. Because it was just like kind of ah, wow, well, look at them. Okay, time to put away my tinker toys. I got to carry these things around now. <laughs> <laughs> I have no more room for that. Yeah. <laughs> well, my question to you. So I, I'm, I in my life I've been both, and sometimes it it vacillates between the two. But showering or not showering in the morning. So I'm assuming I'm going to give her a benefit of the doubt that she's a night shower. Mm -hmm. So showering in the morning is understandable, but not brushing your teeth or like wiping the crust from your eyes. She just yeah. woke up and puts the dress on and walk. And then she just leaves. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> woke up in like full makeup, hair done. Yeah. Like, already we got to go. So <laughs> um, your breasts and you're ready for the day. And so she, like you said, she puts a bunch of toys in a bag to get rid of them, but she keeps a teddy bear. Um, again, on the news, she, we do hear the escape about uh, the escapee Russ Thorn. Uh, from now on, like what I'm discussing, I'll just say Thorn, because mm. Thorn is a better killer name than Russ. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Who, Russ. Could you imagine like getting killed by somebody named Russ? How pissed I mean, would you yeah. be? Yeah, I mean I that mean. would be my luck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, apparently he killed five people in Venice, California in 1969. 
So uh, we see her parents, they're leaving for a trip. We uh, then see the neighbor, uh, I believe his name is Mr. Content. Yeah. Uh, which this fucking guy needs to go Who fuck is away. this guy? Yeah. And <laughs> he's going to be watching the house. I didn't know if he was supposed to be like another maybe like, oh, is this a bad guy too? Oh. Is this the real bad guy or something? But no, he's just a creep. Yeah. A random creep neighbor yeah. it, it felt like if if she if this role were cast by for with a woman she would be like the snoopy next door neighbor because yeah. the but, thing is he's not like he's not really creeping on the girls or anything he's just like weirdly nice and then like stalks whatever the bug is or i can't remember yeah the slug yeah <laughs> slugs yeah it's yeah, a really weird just weird he's just a weird just dude strange yeah just yeah. very strange character um, and but he, we find out that he's gonna be watching the house and her for them while they're gone, and she mumbles shit under her breath, and uh, her mom reminds her to lock all the windows and doors, and she reminds her mom that she's eighteen. Okay, I'm eighteen now, mom. You're eighteen now, mom. <laughs> Didn't you see my breasts? <laughs> uh, and then uh, so she throws the bag of toys in the garbage and walks down the street. Suddenly, a hand reaches from off camera and grabs a Barbie doll from the bag. Yes, that was kind of a cool little a little surprise. There wasn't wasn't expecting it, and then, but they do use that a couple of times. Mm-hmm. But the, the POV shot and mm-hmm. all that sort of stuff. So, um, then a school bell rings, and we are at the local high school where we meet local creeps Jeff and Neil. <laughs> do you want to? What did you think of these? I mean, they're idiots. I mean, yeah. they're fine. They're just dumb. <laughs> just dumb. This is like every guy that you see. Like I grew up in the eighties, so I remember watching like what's that name? Those brat movies, uh, Revenge of the Nerds, and uh-huh. like Porky's, and those. Like if you watch them now, you're like Jesus Christ, people, like jock kind of like dude, rapist stuff. Yeah, like it's yeah, yeah, really yeah. scary. But so like you would see them in those like they would be at home in those types of movies. I think like they later on they're like peeping Tom and they're like. Yeah yeah it's, it's really they're gross <laughs> yeah yeah it's like it's so weird that we're supposed to think that they're cool guys or, or it's okay i don't know did, did it seem to you like they were making it seem like it was okay or were they were you supposed to think of them as creeps right off the bat? i'm not i'm not sure okay. i mean they, i definitely just got a ugh, i hate them like vibe immediately yeah, yeah, yeah. our introduction is basically them cat calling this uh who is it a phone repair yeah or something yeah and uh and she's obviously not interested but she also is not like you know you know scolding them or anything yeah yeah. she's just like okay i'm just gonna do my job bye (laughs) um so i i thought that 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 they were not cool guys but supposed to be cool guys to the characters in the movie i'm not sure what we the audience were supposed to think of them because they definitely were not cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> In any stretch of the imagination. I think I, you know, I've just watched so many 80s horror movies that when I see these guys, I'm like, oh god, these guys again. Like I know the archetype and I know like what they're gonna be doing. And it's I'm kind of like done with that. So mm-hmm. I have a little lower threshold for it. But but yeah, I see what you're saying. So I certainly was excited to see them die. I, yes. I, I can't uh, wait until these guys get killed. Yes. <laughs> My one of my first notes, and I, I'll, yeah. I'll, we'll get there. But so they're talking about girls. They're at, I'm sorry, yeah, they're talking about asking girls to the dance, and it's not even girls that they like. It's just like girls who they think will say yes. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like just checking off a box sort of thing for them. Um, they then see a telephone repair woman, and I believe it was Jeff. At, uh, I was like, oh, hold my, hold my stuff. I'm gonna go talk to her, and asks her out by saying. Uh, you know, would you be interested in younger men? You know, you know what they say about them. And like you're saying, she plays it off good and good naturedly. And because of course she has to, because if she doesn't, if she's a bitch, then they're going to call her a bitch or something like that, you know? So for her safety, she has to play it off good naturedly. Um, And he helps her with the ladder to her van. Uh, After she rejects him, they walk away. And then do you remember what happens here? Well, she, she she gets snatched, doesn't she? Yeah. yeah. And she gets like pulled into the van, like, you know, and as they're just, they're not even that far away. 
yeah, it's, it's ridiculous. Like, and it's just like, ha, 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 ha ladies. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but I did like the surprise yank. Into, I was not expecting that. Uh, but it's a cool. Well, as as soon as she opens the door but looks away, I was like, okay, she's gonna get snatched. <laughs> yeah, but it was still still cool. Um, so she gets pulled in next. Like you're saying, we, we see them walking away, and in the background, we see her like pounding on the window. They're not paying attention to her at all. It's like once it, I guess the satire or the commentary is that you know, once a woman is no longer interested in you sexually, they no longer, you know, ah. have have any value towards you look i'm gonna make this movie deep okay yeah no i mean that that's probably a pretty good call there i I thought that was a pretty uh i thought that was a pretty gnarly kill i mean you don't really see but it's a pretty icky way to die yeah so um they they don't hear her and then um we see in the window she continues to fight for their attention then we're inside the van (laughs) And a denim jacketed assailant has this poor one on the floor of the van when suddenly he pulls out a power drill. She's screaming the whole time. He brings the drill closer to her. Then the camera cuts away to the walls of the van as the blood splatters over them and her screams fade. How mad are you for getting killed by not only a dude in a Canadian tuxedo, but his name is Russ. Oh, like, Russ. <laughs> Hold I mean, my jean jacket. I'm about to drill you. I am so I am so sad for this delivery. Yeah. This telephone repair woman. Yeah, um, I, I do. I feel bummed for her. And like we were talking about this morning, my husband and I, and it's like it's a very scream to way to die. Yes. <laughs> yes. You know? And it's just such such a disservice to the poor character to die like that, you know, and especially by someone in a yeah, a jean jacket. <laughs> 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 like, couldn't you at least throw the jean jacket over me and make me not have to watch <laughs> yeah. my death um yeah no it's, it's sad i feel bad for her <laughs> yeah uh, so then we jump cut to the high school girls playing basketball we see coach Jana yelling instructions to them from the sidelines it was a pretty abrupt cut but i know that 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 was for a reason it was just like what level of hell is this where there where these girls are playing basketball without bras that <laughs> sounds so painful i was watching it i'm like what is happening why are they playing basketball <laughs> i was thinking of like like the the producer corman was probably like what is the sport that is the most bouncy the jiggliest, <laughs> the jiggliest sport we could think of i mean he nailed it yeah nailed it. but i was just like oh this hurts more than anything in the movie i've seen so far he just like all oh, that friction you know yeah oh yeah. Yeah, no, it was a yeah, it's a pretty abrupt cut from you know silencing the woman to the. Yeah. So, <laughs> so then we do meet Valerie here, um, and so they're all playing basketball. She's pretty good at it, um, and we find out that she's new at the school, and all the guys, the the guys are on the sideline ogling her or them actually while they're playing. And the girls seem to kind of hate Valerie because she's good at basketball and they call her like a teacher's pet. Um, There was a lot of teenage bitchiness, girl to girl bitchiness here. Do you, um, did you connect with that at all? Like, did you find that to be um, true to life sort of thing? Yeah, I, I, I would. And depending on your, your, you know, groups that you hung around with, certainly, uh, in high school you know your hormones are going crazy and you don't really know what you're saying all the time and, or how mean you're being um yeah. I don't think you know kids realize how evil that they can be I mean they're literally just a couple feet away from her being like man, 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 like talking yeah. shit about her <laughs> it's just like so messed up because it's like she's good at basketball <laughs> like who cares and some of the insults of her were pretty funny and we'll, yeah. we'll get to that in a second but all right so next we had this gratuitous, gratuitous gym shower scene. Oh, great. Here's what I don't understand. Like we've established that Trish is 18. So it was like, quote unquote, fine that we saw her breasts. Yeah. But there's no way that all the girls in this shower are 18. They are all like, 18. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> like I'm, I'm sure like filming, yes. But like yeah. character wise. Yeah, they're all 27. <laughs> <laughs> So like we're just supposed to be watching under underage girls showering. It's like very weird. Like it is strange. I mean, especially because now that 
I I have never showered in that capacity in any school I've ever been in, where it's just like we're all facing each other with our yeah. asses out. I know those things, you know, showers exist, but obviously it's right there. But yipes! Not, not <laughs> no, thank you. The the closest I would get, we had uh, the showers in my high school where it was one pole. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, so there was multiple poles, but the one pole, and then there would be sh- like four shower heads, well, maybe two. I don't remember how many shower heads on the top of each pole. So there was just like <laughs> four dudes converging on a pole <laughs> with with the shower. So uh, that was yeah. really weird. Just like yeah. dogs touching or something like that. Yeah. So like the closest I ever got to that was just doing that, but keeping my short time. Like yeah, under, yeah. Know? I mean, I've done the, like the communal, where it's just one big shower room, but all the like shower heads are on the wall, so you're no, you're just facing a thing. And they did that once just to say I did it and get the credit for gym. Yeah. But <laughs> <laughs> it's like you have to shower at least once. <laughs> that like, is okay. so weird. It's is... weird. It's very. It's like why? Could you explain to me the exact reasons why I need to shower just once to get credit for gym? And you're just there, like looking. Yeah, at, you're just like, taking okay, notes. Check that so, off. Very weird. Very. Um, weird. I do think that that entrance to that scene is probably one of the greatest lines I have ever heard in any movie, where it's just like, "You're just getting bigger." <laughs> And then what I thought was funny was multiple girls say, who mine? What? <laughs> or like, they want to like, yeah. That was, that was amazing. And I feel like I need to incorporate it in, into my everyday life <laughs> a little bit more. Just anytime I see anyone, like I haven't seen in a while. You're, like you're my dad, big. you know, <laughs> your tits are getting bigger, dad. Your husband walks in yeah. and you're like, your tits, your tits are, are getting bigger. bigger. <laughs> yeah. No, I think it's just a great way to start the day and, and yeah. we'll get to know someone. Yeah. <laughs> And then, so did you notice here that uh, one of the most appalling things in this movie, and it's one of the most appalling things that I've seen in a horror movie in a very long time, one girl asks the other girl for her soap bar. They're sharing soap. That's weird. Yeah. I was like, what? And then she, here, so the one, the one woman, like, so you go like down the body, I think. With I, I mostly I do, I do liquid soap now, but like you go down when you have a bar of soap, you go down the body and the butt is typically the last thing. Right, you're not gonna go butt to face, right? Although I think this is the thing in Friends, but yeah. <laughs> so in the movie, the woman finishes with the butt and then hands the woman the the other woman the soap bar who goes to face. It's, it's a like, little what? strange. It's a little strange that they have communal soap. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm not. I'm not on board with that. <laughs> but I'm, yeah. not, I'm not on board with the whole showering scenario. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I guess i guess if you're gonna if you're gonna shower in that way i get you might as well go like whole hog with it you know share yeah. soap share towels yeah. share loofahs, whatever you yeah. gotta do just dry each other off just like rubbing it yeah up. yeah just like you know and then a little you know playful towel whipping let's let's just go for it like girls do right you've, you've done it all, oh, time. all the time all the time <laughs> so uh <laughs> so trish is kind of inviting some of the girls to her part to a party at her house since her parents are out and then Trish and Valerie like lock eyes, like, I, like something like it was very sapphic. Or I don't, I don't understand. Did you notice this? I, I, I note. I was very intense, but I, I wasn't sure if it was supposed to be like threatening or. Well, because she, she walks over to her and invites her to a party, and she, she tells her how good she was on court. So she was, it was a. It was friendly. It was I may, maybe it was supposed to be an, an acknowledgement, but to me, it was very like sexual tension. No, I'll have to. Yeah, I, um, I I gotta rewatch it again when I'm not just like so baffled by the whole thing. Yeah, <laughs> uh, let's get this straight, Jessica. There's no reason to rewatch this movie again. You don't have to rewatch it again. But but yeah, it, I, the I, second one. <laughs> like I didn't want to just write titties, titties, titties for this. Yeah, but that was, it was yeah. But there was other That's things because I wrote that verbatim many times. <laughs> I know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, she, she walks over, tells her how good she was on the court. Trish tells um, Diane that she's going to. Um, sorry, Trish tells Diane that she's plans on inviting Valerie to the party. And at the same time, also reminds Diane that there there are no boys allowed. So, she, so she's trying to have this slumber party with her friends, like back in the old days, because apparently they've grown older and they're always hanging right. out with their friends. So they just want a <laughs> girls' night out. And there's always that one girl, just like with boys, mm-hmm. just like with dudes, when we have like, hey, let's just do the boys today. Mm-hmm. 
there's always that one person who can't get away from their boyfriend or their girlfriend or their significant other just mm-hmm. has to invite them along or cut the night short and it's always like it's always a little bit lame mm-hmm. um and then so um they ask i think it's uh trish asks diane what her problem is with valerie and she she says ah she drinks too much milk yes that's right i loved that i can't believe i didn't write that down because i love milk so i was just like oh she's my girl then we got we're going okay okay <laughs> she drinks too much milk i was th- does that have it what does that mean no it doesn't have anything to do with anything yeah okay okay <laughs> I don't understand. Yeah, no, if it's a deep cut or a reference of something, I, I didn't get it. I yeah. just loved it because it was absolutely bizarre. And I'm like, great, now I'm going to die because I drink too much milk or I'm never going to get invited to parties. Yeah. <laughs> and so um, they're like, you sure it's not how, how you sure it's not because of how pretty she is or how good she is at basketball and or how pretty she is. And she goes, uh, oh, she works at it. <laughs> She works at being pretty. Yeah. Uh, does that mean? So I feel like Diane is not a girl's girl. No, no. Yeah. <laughs> she's very yeah. strange. Yeah. And uh, she's like the epitome. She's like, I don't like people I have to get to know, which is like the epitome of no new friends. It's yeah. Like- yeah. So you have to like just effortlessly be her friend and be effortlessly pretty. Well, it's so weird because isn't that the girl who just rolled out of bed and like got ready for the day? It doesn't look like she tried very hard. Uh, that's no, that Diane oh. is the friend. The friend Again, that- I, yeah. I can't tell any of these ladies. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, because they're in a locker room, Valerie hears all of this. Uh, well, yeah. Oh, yeah. She's great. <laughs> She's literally on the other side. But I, I, that, yes teenagers do do that like i've been in locker rooms i've been in the lockers where people are talking about each other in the hallway and they're right there so that that's understandable very sad um so then uh valerie tries to leave because she's embarrassed um but trish follows her and tells her you know uh well first of all trish regardless tells diane that she's gonna invite her um she stops valerie from leaving and she invites her valerie says that she can't but she's obviously upset by what she's overheard. Uh, Later, the girls are walking outside with Jeff and Neil who are trying to score an invite to the party. (laughs) This is where we get uh, for our first look at Thorne because we, I don't think we saw him in the van too much. We just saw his outline and his body, the back of his, the back of the jean jacket. (laughs) Uh, But we we see him, he's like uh, in the van now, and we see a, a shot of him from the wind, from the mirror, the side mirror, which I'm a sucker for that shot. I, I love that shot. Yeah, that's good. No matter how many times I see it. <laughs> um, Linda, somebody we haven't met yet. She was just one of the girls in the background. She breaks off from the pack saying she forgot something in the locker. So she has to leave. And it's an overhead shot of this happening. She walks away from the crowd um, we as the viewers see that, but we also see the inside of a dumpster, and inside the dumpster is the body of the telephone repair woman, mm-hmm. which I thought was a really interesting shot, yeah. and I really, really like that. Mm-hmm. For a first-time director, uh, you know, those are, unless the shot like that was already in the, in the script, but yeah. who knows. <laughs> Uh, I do know that uh, the, uh, the director, uh, Amy Holden Jones, said that from the original script, because it was written as a satire, there wasn't a lot of horror or straight up comedy elements in it. It was more like situational satire. Okay. So she ended up, so Amy has a writing credit on this as well. I forget if it's uncredited or not, but she did co- write some of the script as well to include some of the scares and, and some of the uh, punch up the humor. Mm-hmm. That's cool. And I think at this part, it was just kind of like where she's going back into the school. I was like, is it going to be her who gets it? Or is it going to be the the gym teacher? Because I think that they were kind of showing both of them in the same area. So I was just like, I liked that kind of bit of like, who's it going to be next? Yeah, yeah. So as she said, she does pass uh, Coach Jenna on the way out. Coach Jenna hurries, uh, tells her to hurry up because the building will be closed soon. I mean, when she meant it, because that was like 10 seconds. They were- yeah. <laughs> like, they must have like the automatic locks, like, yeah. like in a prison or something, you yeah, know? Yeah, right. <laughs> um, 
the co coach continues outside and, and actually passes the van. Mm -hmm. And when she passes the van, we now see that Thorn is conspicuously absent from its interior. Mm -hmm. Love it. I like the visual storytelling. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. And that's why I'm like, where is he going to go? Where is he? Is he yeah, exactly. cool or is he going to follow her? So. so Linda gets a book from her locker, but quickly realizes that she can't leave the building. All doors are locked. There's All one next with so <laughs> either he is extremely fast or all the doors were locked except for one and then he yeah. put the um chain around that one because we mm -hmm. do see there's even one with the chain on it which is completely illegal to do yeah. in any high school <laughs> like it's like that's just asking for trouble like people yeah. are dying you know so uh she's trying to get out find a way out um we we do we then see Thorn creeping up behind her. Again, the it's just a different way of shooting it. And I wonder if it's because she's a first time director. Instead of like us just seeing her and nothing behind her and then and then he jumps out, mm -hmm. we see him walking towards mm -hmm. her slowly. So that's the um uh, the uh drama or the uh, suspense yeah. part there. Where we as the audience are like Run! Run, yeah. turn around you know kind of thing yeah well so, yeah it's an it's it's definitely a, a choice to do that and i liked that especially since we're not being you know since it it is so matter of fact already who the killer is what is exactly going to happen all these people are just are going to be taken out but in what order and how basically um so i i like that element of it i think it would have been probably oh silly to do it the other way yeah so then he gets right behind her and stabs her with a drill that has a huge drill bit connected. That's crazy. So I guess now we could talk about this. Yes. I, I read a, a uh, letterbox review that was like basically where they were like, hmm, that drill bit is supposed to represent something. I'm not quite yeah, sure what it's supposed to represent. <laughs> it's like on the tip of my tongue and I can't quite figure it out, but it's supposed to represent something. And then they're like, sometimes a drill bit is just a drill bit. Mm -hmm. but, but yeah, so obviously, like, this drill bit represents mm -hmm. a, a penis, a dick, right? And I was just like, a after this, now we've gotten the second kill, I was like, wow, he really only kills with that thing. That's his weapon that he's chosen. Yeah. <laughs> An absurdly long drill bit that just seems like the most unwieldy. One hundred percent. You can't surprise someone with it. Like, you know, do you see how far, how high going. above his head he has to go? <laughs> and uh, like, just think of the upper body workout he's getting every time he has to do yeah. that. You know, it's... and it and it somehow is the perfect weapon for a guy named Russ. In a jean jacket. In a Canadian tuxedo, the jean jacket <laughs> it's and the so jean pants. perfect. Because <laughs> it's like, oh, Russ, you were so close to being good. Uh, <laughs> you're so, so close. Um, and that's what you chose. No, but it was, it, I, I, I think it's. I think it's. A, it's an amazing weapon, and I'm. I'm. I like how it gets dispatched later on. Later on, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, which was a reshoot, by the way, which was great. Okay. It, was, it was great to hear. But yeah, so the cat's out the bag. He's wielding a dick and killing women with it. So like basically, <laughs> um, uh, so he uh, he gets her. I think it's in the shoulder, something like that. He, but she manages to get away. He loses her in the locker room, and she hides in the showers and trying to keep herself quiet um, after being injured. And then there's this pool of blood that's gathering beneath her. He almost loses her entirely until he notices the pool of blood leaking through the bottom of the doorway. He then uses the drill to get through the locked door. She screams out into the empty building, and that's the last we see of Linda. So Linda was actually supposed to play Trish. Um, so Linda is played by Brink Stevens, who is uh, the, the the scream queen. Right, right. She was supposed to be. She was supposed to play Trish, but she was a. No, she was a model. I don't remember if it was a nude model, but she was a model at the time, and she had a a job already lined up that she had to go for, so she wasn't available for all the for shooting the movie. So they gave her this smaller part. Um, so afterwards, Thorne runs to the van, 
And uh, at this point, I was thinking again, like, this is 1982. It's not a mass killer. This just looks like a dude running yeah. in his jean jacket to a van. It's just, yeah. uh, it, for me, uh, it wasn't scary. He didn't look scary. He's not scary. Yeah. Um, I mean, the scariest thing about him is he just, he's just killing random people for basically no reason. Yeah. Yeah. So, and apparently he's very quick with locks and chains and stuff like that. And he can sneak in and out being <laughs> undetected, I guess. But uh, yeah, no, he's not, he's, not a, he's not really scary at all. He looks like he would like guest star on Full House or something <laughs> like, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and just thinking about it, I think I was reading this too. This is kind of like formatted a bit like Halloween, this uh, escaped convict. Or a convict is, escapes. He had killed somebody. Somebody previously escapes. Years later, comes across a group of women, uh, a group of girls at a high school. Follows them later into the night where they're all congregated, and then kills them. So right, that's really that's basically Halloween. I guess uh, is this coming off of like you know late seventies and like Son of Sam and all these uh, like where there were lots of like break ins and how home oh, invasion yeah. probably why we got because it seems like there were a lot of horror movies around that time that were very much escaped madman and yeah I wonder if it was like a response into all that stuff in like the late seventies yeah I think I think you're right there I think you have something and like uh, was it the BK do like I, just I, of, I can't i can't remember when all that happened i'm not big into the, the biggest into true crime but I, I i i know who you're talking about yeah, yeah. Uh, so later we see that uh Tr we see trish get dropped off by some dude on a motorcycle and that we do see that valerie lives right next door um so diane is then followed by thorn very reminiscent of of uh Laurie Strode getting followed by Michael in the car. Uh, then he pulls over and gets out and follows her by foot. Then we get this POV of someone reaching out for her shoulder. And, she, and then once, once that person does, she grabs their arm and judo flips them, which is great <laughs> to see. <laughs> and we find out that it's John, her boyfriend, um, which I think he was punching up a little bit with that. I don't, I don't think they were on the same I level. I was like, how did he pull her? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, what a odd looking i mean there were lots of odd choices for the uh supposedly good looking guys yeah <laughs> i was just like all right sure even, even later in the movie somebody asks like what do you think she sees in him and i was like yeah i know i, I don't guess. know <laughs> yeah but uh maybe he's got a great personality ah uh, well he kind of pressures her a little bit so he's an asshole but yeah that's we'll true. Get there. So. Um, he's asking about tonight. Um, she's like, it's girls only. He's like, oh, come on. You, you can get away from that. It's like, dude, just let her go hang with her friends. Like, Yeah, right. I, you know, um, I don't know. I can't get in the mind of a, of a teenage boy anymore. But like, and I get it, you're horny. But like, let her hang out with her friends. Yeah. Um, later, Coach arrives to her house. And uh, as she's trying to open the door, a drill bit comes flying at her from inside. Um, and it, it was just like a, uh, uh, what is it called? Like a, uh, worker, a, uh, custodial worker or something like that mm -hmm. for her apartment building or something. I don't know what the fuck yeah. it actually was. <laughs> um, but, uh, they were putting in a new people, which is, yeah. I, I thought it was a pretty good gag. I, yeah, I, it is. It is good. <laughs> uh, come to find out that the, the woman who played that, um, or the, the uh, carpenter or whatever the person drilling the hole mm -hmm. um she was her name was pamela Consano. she was actually on the set in real life working on the movie oh. she was a carpenter uh for the movie and they just used her for that oh that's cool yeah um so next trish is at home alone and finds her door jar she locks it up then she decides to play some piano she's multi-talented she's a jock and a music nerd we love it, do it all. <laughs> yeah and she hears the footsteps in the house and she gets scared and she tries to run to the door and she makes it uh right before a hand reaches out and it uh, to grab her and it's the neighbor uh mr content and I, i'm like he says he saw the door open and came to investigate dude make yourself known 
if you got a teenager <laughs> home alone and you're sneaking around like i don't th- i don't know you like your neighbor but like i don't think you have the best intentions if you're just yeah like, he's very he's a very he, he, i don't know he's suspicious but like not suspicious which yeah. makes him suspicious <laughs> yes exactly <laughs> Like you try to come off as, as the nice guy, but I don't know what his deal is. Yeah. So uh, back with the coach, she's making dinner and she spills some wine in the most obvious place possible. Literally, the wine of glass is halfway off the counter. It's mm-hmm. like, you know, uh, but she drops the wine, uh, breaking the glass. Uh, she grabs and she hears a noise and she grabs a shard of the glass, which you were in the kitchen. Mm-hmm. You, were, you had a knife. Yeah. yeah. Why? Look at my little shard. I'm gonna yeah. get you. Which you're also gonna really hurt yourself if yeah, you use right? that as a weapon as well. I don't know. It's just uh but she goes open the door and of course it's a jump scare. It's a kitty. It's mm-hmm. the 80s. We're gonna have jump I was, scares. I was like, how how was that cat stuck in the closet the whole time and it wasn't yowling its head <laughs> off like prior to that? Well, it's obvious that she interrupted her playtime. She wanted to be in the closet. She's <laughs> yeah, like, what the fuck? Yes. Leave me alone. <laughs> yeah. All the times I keep my cats in the closet as well. I mean, just <laughs> yeah. so then uh strange animal stuff in this movie too. A dog that never presents itself. Like <laughs> slugs, and slugs. Like, yeah. <laughs> so uh, later at night, Jeff and Neil decide to go scare the girls as one does. Um, and they are walking by the van as they're talking about it, and you know, they're walking down the street. So we see that they're in the neighborhood the same as the killer is. So Valerie looks on as the girls start to arrive. Um, and then she's so she's looking out at the house and then we see thorn hiding in the bushes which is really creepy thorn <laughs> bushes yeah oh there you go <laughs> so the doorbell rings and uh she asks who is it and i i i don't remember who says it but they're like we're here for the orgy and they they brought beer and then because the neighbor mr content is still in the house She's trying to play it off as soda. She's like, oh, great. You brought soda pop. It was actually beer. <laughs> and then I think it was Kim busts out some weed. And she's like, look, I got that Maui Waui. <laughs> and but what? Mr. Mr. Content sees it. And he's like, even though Trish is like giving her this international signal to be cool. Mm-hmm. But he's like the cool neighbor. He doesn't. He's like, I won't tell. Uh, as long as you don't tell your parents that I scared you, which that's suspicious. Yeah, I know. That's so weird. Like, why would I tell them? Yeah. Except to be like, hey, Mr. Content was being a weirdo again. Yeah, why wouldn't I tell in our them? House. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> if somebody tells you not to tell your parents something when you're a kid, yep. you should probably yep. tell, tell, tell them right away. Or, tell somebody, anybody. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so he leaves. Uh, later on, Valerie is making sugar with a little bit of Kool Aid. Yeah, <laughs> because, mm-hmm. because at that point, I don't know if in the seventies or eighties, Kool Aid was different. I don't remember it, but like, was Kool Aid just like dye, and you had to add the sugar, or well, did it already sugar. come sugared? No, I mean, as far as I remember, like you needed to add sugar to Kool Aid, like for okay. otherwise it tasted like bitter. So then it was just dye. Some I. I don't know what it was like just I I did not like Kool-Aid yeah but, um I felt like it was kind of like you you added like maybe like a cup of sugar or something okay. like that um but more most people added a lot a lot more sugar <laughs> yeah <laughs> um because that looked like diabetes in a cup that was yeah like... yeah I was not I was not a big Kool-Aid person now if it was if it was Kool-Aid a bunch of mixed together and you called it bug juice I would drink the hell out of it. Like I was, yeah. but whatever that bug juice is, I'm I'm all about it. But if you call Did it, they cool, have alcohol in bug juice. No, I was. I don't know. It was just usually a bunch of like random like okay. juices and Kool Aids mixed together. I think I'm thinking of like jungle juice. <laughs> jungle juice is yes. That's all the alcohols mixed together. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so back at the party, they're toking up and they're shit talking Diane, who isn't there. Uh, they're like she's got a big mouth, and uh, it's too much milk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like 
um, it's, they're like, it's not how big your mouth is, it's what's in it that counts. Um, but I, I did just, not understand that at all. Yeah, like, what I, does that mean? Yeah. Like, so I, I was talking this up to girl talk, like teenage girl talk, but mm-hmm. I, it just wasn't making sense. It's mm-hmm. a, I don't, un- yeah. I mean, the kind of girl talk, like the bitching about someone that, that makes sense. But like the, I don't, the insults are so weird. Yeah. I don't, I don't get it at all. It just sounds like they mad libs, like the, the, <laughs> the insults. <laughs> It sounds like they black po- blackout yeah, poetry. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they took the script and they made blackout poetry up from yeah. it. So, they came up with it. so uh, now begins what I would like to say, like this rinse and repeat cycle of hearing noise outside and going to investigate. Because it probably happens a dozen times in this yep. movie. And so yep. it's really, really slows it down a lot. Yeah. But they hear a noise in the house and they go to investigate. What I like about that sentence I said was they go to investigate Mm -hmm. throughout this movie. A lot of times more than one person. It's in fact, sometimes the whole group goes to investigate the sound, which I thought was really smart because we're always like as horror aficionados and even like the lay person who watches the movie, when people separate, you're like, why are you separating? Go with somebody, you know? Yeah. I did like that part there. Mm Mm-hmm. So um, they, they they go to the kitchen. They re- realize that it was a coffee pot that broke because she left it on the stove. Or yeah, on the stove. And then um, and then they also get uh, a little bit of a jump scare by Diane here. So another jump scare. So back with Valerie, she's reading with her sister Courtney, and they hear a noise and they go to investigate. Or she, sorry, she goes to investigate. Courtney runs upstairs to Valerie's room, like rummaging through it. Do you remember what she was looking? Yeah, for? she's reading like a Playgirl. <laughs> Do you remember who's on the cover? No. Sylvester Stallone. Oh, right. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I was just that. What a weird, finally, an opportunity to run upstairs and read my sister's dirty magazine. Like, what? Like, and, how long have you been thinking about? <laughs> and she even, like, Valerie even says that, like, sh- she knows that her sister Courtney has been boy hungry since, like, the fifth yeah. grade or sixth grade or something like that. She gets so offended. Yeah, she does. She really does. <laughs> But I, I I like I like the fact that they show that girls get horny too. Yes, you know, like I Valerie mean, has it, and her little sister's horny for it, and you know I like that part. Yeah, I liked that. I just it it was so weird how her twenty three year old little sister, um, <laughs> like how. <laughs> Like she gets so upset when uh, she suggests that she's been like masturbating, and she's like. What? you know she gets so upset and i was like you're literally on the bed with a play girl yeah yeah well, oh there's oh, yeah there's a scene i want <laughs> to get so that funny. later um so uh outside valerie spooks herself when she sees the the swing swinging when it hadn't been before <laughs> right. and then so she runs inside back with the party the girls are starting like so they they went to the party like in normal clothes and then they start undressing to get yeah. into their slumber party stuff yeah. right in front of everybody, right. like, like, like you do with like your you friends. Do. Like you do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think, what, what? Why are they undressing? Yeah. <laughs> like, okay, sure. That's yeah. fine. And while they're doing so, creeps Jeff and Neil have arrived. And they're just standing outside the window. In front of an open window. In front of an open window, peeping, peeping inside. It, like these girls are jumping at every little like creak and scuttle yet there are two grown men standing outside an open window being like <laughs> and they don't hear anything <laughs> yeah yeah it's <laughs> wild at all <laughs> and this is important to to uh mention here they're in a suburb they're not yeah. out in the country where like houses are like a mile away or just they're like there's a house 20 feet yeah. not even like five or 10 feet away from them, you know, like, and I know like on either side of them. So Valerie's one, one, um, one neighbor. And then the weird neighbor is the other neighbor on either side of them. But like, I see when my neighbor gets a package, like even when I'm not trying to, (laughs) you know, these people, there's two people outside the window looking in and nobody sees anything. They're just just like, what? Let me just take off my top. And and, and then we'll see later on. I I noted it, but 
they don't just hang out there. They have beers and they're like sipping. <laughs> they them. They? Like this, this is <laughs> their plans for the night. Yeah. yeah <laughs> strange. So, but they almost get caught when uh, I believe it is Jackie goes and dumps the ashtray out yeah, of the window. Um, was she, like dumping that out in the yard? Just the weed, just like the little uh, ashtray. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. And, and then um, the boys, the, the guys are like, uh, what did we do to deserve this? We must have died and went to heaven. And I said, here, I think that will be true faster than you can think. Right? Yay! Because, because I'm like, I cannot wait for you to die. Yeah, seriously. So uh, Courtney, uh, so I'm sorry. So uh, Valerie is like searching for her sister. It's like, Courtney, what are you doing? And she's like, oh, I'm doing some homework. And she's like, sure, but don't, te- sure, but don't tear out the centerfold this time. As she was literally tearing out the centerfold yeah. from the playgirl. So I like that she knows her. Yeah, yeah. it is cute. They they are cute. It's, it's a really nice uh, sister relationship. It's not overly like saccharine. Like her sister obviously is angry at her, sometimes even attacks her, but it's all like love. You can yeah. Mm-hmm. Next, we get we're back at the party, and we're <laughs> Trish is making like the best like um, slate of food. Do you remember Twinkies on a plate? Oh my gosh, I totally forgot about that. <laughs> it's just a plate, <laughs> just Twinkies filled with Twinkies, like all in a nice little circle and handing them to your friends. And then there's a bowl of Cheeto puffs and they got a delivery on the way. I'm like, this is teenage teenagers. Yeah, that is good. To a team, yeah. you know? um, and those are the original Twinkies, not the Twinkies yeah. that we got nowadays that are shit. No, no. So then Diane, the only one who hasn't switched into her negligee, her lingerie for the, for the <laughs> lingerie party, uh, decides to go get some wood for the fire. And, I guess this is, I guess you could kind of tell, like if I were the friends, like if I was Trish and Diane hadn't switched into her negligee or her, her, her <laughs> party gear, I'd be like, why aren't you switching? Oh, is it because yeah. your boyfriend's coming later? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Seriously. Uh, so I kind of like that. So she, she goes to the garage where the firewood is kept and we see somebody holding or uh, outside of the garage, I should say. And we see somebody holding a cleaver. Mm-hmm. Guess who it is? You remember who it is? It's Mr. Content. <laughs> what the fuck are you doing? Because yeah. I was like, oh, he's. I was like, is someone gonna? He's finally gonna kill someone with something other than the drill. And then, nope, it's the weirdo. <laughs> it's the weird neighbor. The weird so, neighbor hunting so he, slugs. Or slugs. Yeah, he's he's uh, she, he's hunting slugs. But here's the thing. I just thought of right now, if we had had it where we didn't know who the killer was immediately mm-hmm. within like first two minutes of the movie mm-hmm. um, or three minutes, when we first see Russ, mm-hmm. when we first see Thorne, uh, if it was still left as a mystery, I think the inclusion of the neighbor would have been really good. It would have made sense in that capacity. Otherwise, it's just, it's a very strange choice for him to be so like red herring kind of guy. Yeah, yeah it's like, who are you trying to fool? We see. Yeah. We see. It was like, are they going to be like partners? <laughs> like, Two killers would have been real dope. Yeah, mm-hmm. I was. I I kept getting confused because, because yeah, because scenes like this where he's just hunting slugs like you do. Yeah, with a cleaver. Which I think they actually killed those slugs, which is terrible. Yeah, sad. Yeah. Poor slugs. Um. So then um, she walks away with the firewood and he goes to kill another slug. But suddenly Thorn creeps behind him and we we hear the drill going. Then the body hits the floor and we see the full drill bit in his neck. And it looked, it looked pretty good. Yes. I wrote, I'm glad he got drilled. Yes. <laughs> I'm glad we don't have to see this slightly creep creeper uh, yeah. around anymore. Um, and so... It, so far the movie hasn't been very violent like it's always they always cut away before and i'm sure that has to do with budget as well um but but it's it's still you know fairly not a violent movie yeah yeah it hasn't there hasn't been any like big gore moments just implied yeah yeah and i was thinking nobody heard that yeah Yeah. (laughs) there's a lot of moments like that where it's like yeah and i'm like okay whatever and i think um at this point like uh 
Jeff, we, we, we see that Jeff and Neil are just there drinking beers outside. And I think either Jeff or Neil like says, did you hear that? But that's it. Yeah. I, I don't think that's. Yeah. There's, doing. there's a lot of like, like the, the thing with the, the trash cans keep getting disturbed by this dog that doesn't exist. And it's just like, we keep yeah. going to check the trash cans and it's like, okay, I get if it's not actually a dog and it's the killer, but where is the dog? Your dog is missing. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see the dog. Let us see the dog. It's cat. the dog that we saw a cat. Like, where's this so-called dog that you own? Yeah. <laughs> so then the girls are kind of like reading horoscopes uh, and like making funny little jokes there. Relatable. Yeah. And uh, Trish goes to close a uh, window, but when she does, she sees Thorn peeking in, and she closes the curtain. And asks Diane if she closed the garage door. So my question to you here is, what the fuck? <laughs> like, why doesn't she mention the man outside the house right. immediately, or like, doesn't react to it at all, other than being concerned about the garage door being closed? Which is understandable. I'm glad that she did that, but nothing else comes from this. Yeah, no, not really. Except, um, is there like a cleaver or something? Does he leave the cleaver there? Oh uh, no! So then, so then, she okay. goes and closes okay. the. So she closes the curtain, asks about the Barbie. Uh, I'm sorry about the garage door, sure. and then she looks back outside, looks and the Barbie out. doll is now taped to the window, covered right. in blood. Yeah, and I was like, "How did that get there in enough time?" Right, like, well, that's, that's but, like the two thing. seconds. But yeah, um, did were th did they even know that she went out through the garage? Like, how, where did, was she going, I'm headed out through the garage to <laughs> chop wood. I, I Yeah, I think maybe it's one of those houses where the, uh -huh. maybe the garage is attached to the house and in order to, I don't know. Yeah, yeah it's, not, it's, a, it's a weird thing for her to be like, oh, I thought I saw a man. Did you, and not, not mention it. Yeah. I guess she was like, oh, that's just my imagination going wild with me and you're going, get, getting away from me. But yeah, you think you'd mention seeing someone right there. Right. <laughs> And so one of them was like, oh, it must be the boys, like, you know, pranking. And I'm like, I'm, excuse me, what? Like, you don't excuse away that behavior. Like, uh, even, yeah. Uh, it's just weird. So uh, Trish, uh, Trish says that she had to make sure the gar garage door was closed. So Diane goes with her. Love to see it. Mm -hmm. And it is closed, but it wasn't locked. Then the the light bulb is also out there. So of course it is. So then we see... Thorne's shadow is inside the garage mm. or at least a shadow. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it's somebody else because something else happens a little later. So back with Valerie, she's bored and she's looking out at the party next door and she goes up to Courtney's room and she confiscates her, the, her play girl. She takes it back and then she picks up a banana and she's like, what is this? And the little sister is really pissed about it. What are we implying? Are we I implying know. anything? I don't. I didn't get that either. I mean, it seems like it's implying something, but that's not a thing. <laughs> I, I a banana. That, or maybe she's practicing oral sex. Yeah, I don't. I very don't weird. Very know. weird. No, yeah, it's a, it's. Keep in mind, this was satire. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, and in that in that context, it it makes sense in a way but yeah as a as a serious thing it's very bizarre imagine being rita may brown writing this satire of a movie <laughs> as your first movie ever being made and then seeing it filmed completely straight and I not as a satire you'd be like no the banana was supposed to be a <laughs> joke <laughs> it's like you might as well have a tire iron sitting there yeah, like yeah. <laughs> But it just leads to like, uh, I, I imagine this movie with a group, with a huge group would be real fun because just yeah. all the weirdness that comes from that, I think it'd be a lot of fun. I think some, it would be great to see this remade as intended. So there was, so there's two sequels and then there was a remake fairly recently. Oh, okay. So my, my husband's shaking his head. He's like, yeah. 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 Yeah, but I, I don't know. I haven't seen it. So I don't know if they filmed it that way or not, mm -hmm. it, but I agree with you. It would be cool to to see that yeah. yeah so there's this then they kind of have like a sisterly fight sort of thing um at the party uh back back with the party diane calls her boyfriend uh and the girls are listening in 
which I love. I, I really love the dynamic there. And she calls it boo-boo. I was going to say, what did she call him? Boo-boo. <laughs> yeah. And then she says, like, we can't hear his line, his end of the conversation, but she says, oh, I like it too. Do you think I'm getting better? And yeah. All the boys, all, all the girls crack up on the other end. God. I wonder what she was talking about there. Yeah. Right? Bananas. Bananas. <laughs> So this is where she finds out that the, the girls are listening and then they, they, they go, but okay. the lights, the lights go out here. And uh, so they have to go check on it. They light candles and they, they go downstairs uh, or in the garage. It's possibly a blown fuse. And so uh, I think here, Trish is like, Diane, you stay here and talk to Boo Boo and we're going to go deal with this thing. I love that she's shit talking her friends because that's all I do. You're not my like true friend until I start shit talking. Mm -hmm. So uh, three of them, three of them go down to the garage together. Love to see it. And Diane ends up joining them later. So all four of them went to the garage and they find out there's no blown fuses, but some are missing. So that means somebody has taken them. They then stumble across Jeff and Neil and uh, find out that Jeff and Neil were pulling a prank and they, they, they offer the fuses back. I think it was Jeff who got punched in the face. Like mm-hmm. he, deserved, he deserved more. Yeah. But he got punched in the face with like the flashlight or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they put the fuses back and the lights come back on. So back with Valerie again, she hears more noises outside. It's getting, like I said, really repetitive at this point. She goes to look, the trash cans are spilled again. Um, suddenly she's attacked from behind, but it's by Courtney who has a knife mm-hmm. and she's kind of just playing around, but that's still a little, it's, little it's scary. Yeah. And it's like, Oh, just having fun threatening you with a knife. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've, tra- I've, I have threatened my brother with a tire iron, but that was in a heated argument. <laughs> I'm like, don't come at me with knives. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so later, um, Diane's boyfriend John shows up and he's in the driveway honking the horn and that is a pet peeve of mine I fucking hate hate like unless I tell you if like we're in a hurry and Mm -hmm. this is probably before cell phones or something like that like if if we're in a hurry and I tell you to honk the horn that's one thing but honking your horn for your girlfriend or significant other is just let's go yeah (laughs) it's such a shitty thing to do yeah no I hate it I I mean and that's just just in the characteristics of like the unlikable characters that these guys are. Yeah. Of course he just sits there and honks his horn. <laughs> uh, so she goes out to meet the, um, to meet her boyfriend. She says she can't leave just yet. So he parks in the garage um, over with Val, Valerie and Courtney, they're doing makeup and hair. Um, and Courtney says she wants to crash the party. A nice, another little touching scene between yeah. sisters. Um, then in the car, Diane and John are making out and he's like, like they're, she's trying to get to third base or, or I guess home, home plate. Yeah. And he tries to have sex and he's like pressuring her to have sex. Mm-hmm. And she's like, oh, I can't, my friends are right there. They're going to see. And then like, he's still pressuring her. She's like, okay, I'm going to go, I'm gonna, I'll be right back, whatever. And I just think like, again, like I said it before, but like all the guys in this movie suck and most guys in, mo- in most eighties movies it's really true. suck just yeah they're really they're uh i mean and and i think that it was very you know modeled off of that like that brat packy kind of jock stereotype which hopefully wasn't really a real thing i mean it was probably you know we took guys from the 80s that were annoying and pumped them up a lot but <laughs> hopefully i've never uh, met a guy that was that dickish yeah i i, 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 I but then can't. again i was not a teenager in the 80s yeah. I was a bit of yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so then uh diane goes back inside and leaves john in the garage and he's got this creepy ass smile on his face um so inside trish tries putting a hot dog on jeff's black eye which i thought it was pretty funny yeah. i love the hot dog yeah. on the eye <laughs> And then, uh, because that would probably be something I would suggest. Because I'm like, oh, I don't have any steak. Here's a hot dog. <laughs> Here's a hot dog. <laughs> um, he, okay, help me out here, or maybe don't. I, I, um, this is probably smarter than I, or I, I'm trying to be too smart for my own good. Um, so we already are using, we have a phallic symbol in the drill, 
right? Mm -hmm. Then Jeff gets punched in the girl by a uh, punched in the eye by a woman. Mm -hmm. And in order to soothe that, a woman gives him a phallic symbol, a hot yeah. dog to cool it down. So I'm trying to think, I don't know if there's something there or not. I, I mean, they're probably, it, they could have, uh, they probably could have done any number of meats, <laughs> you know, ham and stuff like that. But, you know, hot dog does feel deliberate, you know. If I titled my episodes, I would title this one, Any Number of Meats. Any Number of Meats. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, Diane tells uh, them that her and John are going to go get some more beer. Everybody knows they're actually going to fuck. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's when, when she walks away, Trish is like, goes to show you, you can't bring back the old days. And uh, so Diane goes back to the garage uh, and she goes inside the car she, and uh, she goes to kiss John. Do you remember uh, what happens here? His whole damn head falls off. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I love that. <laughs> With a drill. With How? a drill. It was like, <laughs> yes. that would so long. There would be so much gore head. and viscera. You would notice, yeah. You would notice. Uh, but yeah, so it's absolutely ridiculous. But oh also my God, really cool. I love it, yeah. Um, so then she's like, uh, so it has, head falls off. She's screaming. She starts honking the horn, but uh, her screams are drowned out by a blender. Because they're making drinks, um, the margs maybe I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. uh, I think even Trish at that point thinks she hears the horn, but but nobody else does. Nobody else in the neighborhood. Like I'll tell you a story. So Hillary and I, my wife Hillary and I, play a video game called Dead by Daylight. I won't get into it, but Hillary is not hasn't been a gamer, so she just started playing games fairly recently, and it's a it's a horror game, so it's kind of scary, right? And there's a killer that's chasing you, and when she when she's getting chased by this killer, she screams out. Like she's literally <laughs> screaming at the top of her lungs. It's like awesome. Having fun, right? Yeah. So uh, she plays in the in the living room and we we leave the door open to get some air to come in from mm -hmm. outside. And my next door neighbor, you know, lives, the house is like five feet from my house, uh, ten, maybe 10 feet. So Hillary's yelling and like for like a couple minutes and then my neighbor comes running out like, hey, are you okay? Oh my gosh. And Hillary's like, yeah, just playing a video game. And so my neighbor's like, okay, I heard you screaming from inside my house, just making sure. <laughs> so like, even yeah. if you don't hear inside, other neighbors are going to hear. Other people are going to hear you getting murdered in a car. Yeah. yeah like, the horn honking. The horn, yeah. yeah. So, uh, maybe, it's, maybe it's just like, hey, you know, people got their own problems. I don't want to <laughs> intrude. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. That's true. So, um, I lost my face here one second. So she honks the horn. Then uh, Thorne shows up and chases her. And she falls to the floor very slowly. And then we see a shot on the ground between Thorne's legs of the drill bit. Mm -hmm. And then we see her in the background, like looking up. And it's, it's like, obviously, mm -hmm. the most obvious this is my dick suck it yeah. sort of thing mm -hmm. it's actually the poster for the movie like that that concept of her of the girls between the legs like that, that came from from this shot and only one of the girls so there's four women on the poster only one of them is actually in the movie <laughs> oh really yeah. oh interesting yeah so uh i know they're all fairly like you can't really tell mm -hmm. who's who like you're saying but yeah. <laughs> But yeah, um, so what did you think of this kill? Um, I, I uh, sorry, sorry, no, but we don't actually see the kill. He just mm -hmm. raises the the drill above his head and brings it down, and then it fades. I mean, it's just it feels like she could have gotten away, probably. <laughs> like if it's coming down very slowly, and it's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I, you know, it's it, it's not it's not my favorite kill of them. But you know, I really I and it especially because we just. We have the the phone conversation where it's like, I'm getting better at it, don't you think? And then the guy loses his head and then it looks like she's giving, you know, in a position to give head to like a yeah. you know, what kills her. It's a it's a very uh it's a nuanced <laughs> scene there, perhaps. Yeah, it's either was it... incredibly nuanced or it's incredibly clumsy. <laughs> I wasn't quite sure what they were trying to say there. Hmm. <laughs> so Back with Courtney, she she did hear the honking and screaming, but Valerie says it's probably just partying, which um, just partying. I, I don't think you should, like you just said, not party. our problem. 
Yeah. Yep. Not our problem. Hey, yeah. it's their party. Yeah. So then uh, uh, back with the party, Trish tells the boys that they're lucky to even still be there after the Barbie joke that they pulled. And the boys are like, what Barbie joke? But just as that happens, the pizza arrives. All right. Wow. And With my favorite line in the movie. So the, the doorbell rings. They, uh, Jeff asks, who is it? And uh, Thorne, well, there's a distorted voice coming through the closeted door. Uh, and we find out later that it was Thorne. And it says, pizza, delivery. Jeff says, what's the damage? And do you want to say the line? It's six. It was at six so far. Yeah, it's like six. Yeah so far like, so far yeah it's so great i loved it yeah pretty pretty great line yeah um one because you know the body count and all that but two yeah, because six dollars for a pizza that's great that's awesome <laughs> yeah no a great i i love that like kind of pun and uh so then uh while this is happening the girls are talking about a baseball game that happened the night before and they, they're trying to figure out who scored the runs and stuff like that. That was an inch, a weird thing where I'm like, why are we, what is their obsession with this baseball game? Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't it, figure out if they were talking about like a high school team or like an actual like major league game. So they were, so uh, reading the trivia on this, it, they were talking about an actual uh, a Dodgers game from okay. the night before that they were shooting this. And so the the score was the score of the actual game, and the runs they were talking about were the runs of the actual game. Okay. Um, but so the coach, uh, so they're like, well, we can't remember, so let's call coach. And um, so <laughs> call, they call coach, yeah, <laughs> free internet, right? Like, yeah, sure. So they call her. So and my my thing was like, oh, they all know each other's numbers because coach even calls Valerie later. Yeah. But I guess if I, I've never been on a high school. Like, a sports team but i would imagine you have a way to reach your coach yeah but i mean i i can't imagine ever calling any any one of my coaches and being like do you remember like the, the score of the game last night like, yeah, such a yeah. Weird, especially because they're playing it's their basketball coach not their baseball i i don't know it was just like yeah very very strange i'm like what season are we in <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um uh... So they call her to to get the answer for the the runs that were scored in last night's baseball game. At that at that time, they also finally open the door, and the pizza guy is standing there with his eyes gouged out, yeah. and he falls flat on his face into the house. They all scream, and Coach hears this, and, and then she's like, "What's happening?" But at that point, they hang up the phone. Yeah. So what did you think of this? Well, I guess it's like kill. Hey, Norm. Uh, for the vo those on the Patreon, we're getting a a visit from Jessica's <laughs> cat, Norm. <laughs> um, I, I I mean, this was a this was probably my first real big favorite of the kills, except for I did like the head falling off. Um, but yeah, it's it's that's drills would go right through the eyes. Yeah, I mean, you have to open sense. there <laughs> you know, to get the second one, like everything. But you know, that's that's a good drill kill yeah killer driller <laughs> uh, there's actually a, a movie uh, i think it was in the 80s as well called driller killer uh, right. i i gotta say i was really with all the cute little like pun things in this i was sad that we didn't get a don't panic this is just a drill kind of like, yeah yeah and I'm like i really wa was waiting for that and yeah uh. I, I, it must be in the second one <laughs> Yes, and we yeah. we will talk about it. <laughs> so then, uh, at this point, they're like they're obviously in trouble. They're scared, but nobody makes a move to change back into their regular clothes. No, <laughs> they no. stay in their. Uh, I need to put on some shoes or something. <laughs> yes, but Trish calls the operator. So this is pre nineteen ninety. Uh, I'm sorry, pre nine one one. Okay. Um. So she has to call the operator, and they say they tell the operator there's been a murder. And the operator says, would you like the police department? Yes, of course we would like the police department. No, send fish and game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, yes, send immediately, connect us immediately. Oh my gosh. But just as they're doing that, Thorne cuts the line outside, so. Um, Which is so, he is a quick guy, I tell you. He is, I mean, that's how he escaped prison, I guess. He's just real wily, because he... 
I feel like he was just, I like I wrote it, he was just staring in the window and then he would like cut the phone lines and like they must just be really close or something. But <laughs> otherwise yeah. he is. He's maybe that's the thing with the slugs. He's the opposite of a slug. You know, he's very quick. He represent and, yeah, and the neighbor was representative of the slugs. Slug, of the yeah. slugs, yeah. <laughs> well, he's also really handy because he has every tool that he needs for the job. He's got the drill. Right. He's got the the snipe, the the scissors and all that. Mm -hmm. So he's pretty handy. So uh, Coach, having just heard the screaming, is concerned and she ends up calling Valerie because she can't get the house. And at this point, I was like. Do they all know each other? But apparently, yeah, because it's the coach. I got like a master phone list or something. Yeah. Well, the phone book. Yeah, this remember is true. phone book was a oh thing. God, I gotta find Valerie's number. God, I remember <laughs> having a look in the phone book for somebody's uh, yeah. phone number. Jeez. Yeah, seriously. Yeah. It's like, oh no, she has a really common last name. <laughs> what street does she live on? Which Valerie is it? Yeah. And then, <laughs> man, I remember there was a. a uh, I'm from Chicago. There was a, a place called Joe Down. No, not Joe Down. Uh, wow, I forget everything. L Luna Pizzeria, Mama Luna's Pizza, and uh, they put a coupon in the yellow book, mm. but you had to reference that coupon in the yellow book. So every week, even though we knew the number, yeah, we would open up the yellow <laughs> book and reference that number in the yellow book and get the discount. Oh uh, my yeah. gosh, that's amazing. Yeah, um, yellow books. Wow, the yellow pages. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I feel old now. Yeah. Yeah. Same. So um, Valerie, uh, I'm sorry, the coach asks Valerie to go take a look, but Valerie's like, oh, I could if you want, but I'd rather not. And the coach says, yeah, you're right. I probably shouldn't be sending another teenager <laughs> to do that. So the coach says she'll go. So back at the Barty house, they're still there. I'm like, just leave. Like, there's no, any number of windows, doors. He can't catch you all. <laughs> like, just leave. Yeah. Which Jeff and Neil are like, okay, they're going to make a break for it. And one of the, the girls are like, I think they're making Neil feel like really brave. They're like kissing him and get, like kissing him in his cheek and all that. Trying to amp, gas him up to go, you know? Okay. I, I did write down something. Was that, there was like, I thought the guys were like kind of weirdly intense with each other. Um, yeah, I think they were like, we need to, we need to do something for the girl. Yeah, I was like, like I wrote, I was like, are the guys into each other? And they're, this was like some big, like, you know, yeah, we're really into, where, is this where the orgy is? Ha -ha. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, I wouldn't put it past them. Um, because we did have that stare between Valerie and uh, uh, Trish earlier. So, uh, so they, uh, Jeff goes to the garage and as he's doing so, he can't open it, and then Diane's body falls from the ceiling, a la Halloween, a la all the slashers ever. How that's how do you time that? Like as a killer, like setting up that kind of like whoa, like how do you how do you get someone's body to fall perfectly as someone is approaching? That's yeah, I don't know, I don't know, but but they're artists, right? That this I, is their I, canvas. I mean, I just want to learn. Yeah. <laughs> so while he's distracted by Diane's body. Thorne gets uh gets him from behind in the chest with with the with the uh, drill. So uh, back with Valerie, she's watching a scary movie with a with the sound really loud, which I have no problem with because that's how I watch them. And uh, Neil arrives at her door and is like pounding on the door, but she doesn't hear him. So and upstairs, Courtney is gossiping on the phone, so she doesn't hear him either. So Thorne runs after him, blue denim flowing in the wind, <laughs> looking majestic. <laughs> and uh, it's too late um, for for uh, Courtney or Valerie to help to help him. He needs to go on the attack. So he lunges at Thorne with the knife. Thorne throws him off to the side. Um, and of course, at that moment, Valerie takes uh, gets up and looks out the window and sees nothing. But they're just off to the side fighting. And then Thorne does stab him to death, like just like uh, the, in the movie that Valerie is seeing on screen. Right. Mm -hmm. And I forgot the name of the movie. I should have written it down. But it's yeah, a, I it's looked it up too, movie. and I didn't write it down. Yeah. Um, so he does kill somebody with a not drill. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. That was the first one. Yeah. Huh. And it's a guy. Uh huh. I wonder if it's because he doesn't want to penetrate a guy. Yeah, 
Yeah, interesting. We have to pay attention to how he kills the other guy there because I forgot. Or yeah. even how he killed. Oh no, how did he kill Mr. Content? Did he kill them with the, he did kill him with the drill? He did get him with the drill. Yeah, so, okay. So um um, back with Courtney, she's talking with her friend about French kissing. So she is really guy. She's like, was it guy hungry or was it boy boy crazy? Boy crazy. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. Boy crazy. So um Thorne drags the body to the garage. He opens up the trunk. It's gonna need a bigger trunk. <laughs> and he's like adding them up. He's like, one, two, three, four. And then he realizes that's one <laughs> missing. And we see it's Jeff. And he's crawling back to the house. Inside, the girls are all huddled together, armed with knives. So they're staying together. They've armed themselves. Love it. And they're waiting for help. I'd argue that maybe someone they should go together. I, I don't know. What what let, what do you think? What do you think the three of them should have stayed there and wait for help? Or do you think that they should have left? Or? I think that if they all left as a group armed, they could get away from that guy. Yeah. I'm- yeah, I, I think they could have, like, yeah, as a group, run down the street, you know, <laughs> knives all, all just, gone for just stay away, just stay away. Yeah. You know? Anybody that comes near them. Else. Yeah, but I mean, because, I mean, they're just sitting ducks there. Yes, yeah. You know, they keep locking themselves in rooms, and it's just like, I mean, he's going to get in eventually, just because he's he's got the magic drill. <laughs> they can't get through any door. Yeah. Um, so... <laughs> No, I, I think they probably could have gotten away, but you know, they they probably would have been tripping over their negligee and like eh, keep turning yeah. around and then fall and then then before you know it, drill time. Imagine if this movie were became like the scary movie of its time. It could have been scary movie, you know. <laughs> it really could have been. I think that would have been really fun. I would have liked to see that a lot. Yeah, same. Especially being of the time. Like, yeah right just, right in the smack dab middle of it yeah that would have been really bold yeah i think so um so one of the, they all say they're getting hungry and then they look at the dead pizza guy's body and <laughs> this is a great scene um, eating pizza off the course <laughs> they're like kim's like he's dead all right so cold and then jackie says is the pizza yeah. and then she takes a slice of the pizza and she says, well, life goes on after all, and eating makes me feel better when I feel bad. And boy, do I feel bad. <laughs> she takes a bite of the pizza, and she says, I feel better already. Really, I do. Really, I do. <laughs> so great. So great. I love you know, it so much. You need, you need a snack occasionally, you know? Yeah. Nothing worse than, like, you know, being stalked by a madman and getting hangry. So, I mean, you really, you really need to take care of yourself in moments like that. Yeah, yeah. So outside, Jeff is at the door, like trying to get in. His blood is getting all on the floor on the door. And they all go to look to hear what's going on. But Thorne gets to him first and he gets the drill right to the head. Mm -hmm. And blood is flowing under the door. The girls see that and they run. Um, So, yeah. So I guess the other guy does uh, get killed by the drill as well. Yep. Drilled. So he just really didn't like uh the dude, um uh, Neil, I guess. Yeah, just, I guess um, maybe he just didn't have his drill handy. I don't know. Yeah. He's you know, giving it a rest for powering up, maybe changing yeah. batteries. I wonder how many how like how much battery power does he have to go through to keep that thing charged up? Right? Yeah. Like we huh? <laughs> he's just like while he's not on screen, he's just charging it. Right? Yeah, it's just like I got a charging station over here. <laughs> in the band yeah. <laughs> so uh coach we do see that the coach is on is in her car on the way to the house right now so uh valerie then calls for courtney it, it, she's in, she's in her house and she's calling for courtney she doesn't see her in her house and she looks outside and see that courtney is walking to trisha's house so she's like fuck and she goes and follows her um, Courtney's at the door, but once she hears Valerie coming, she goes and hide. Valerie knocks on the door and rings the doorbell. Jackie is like, oh, we need to help her. You know, like she's going to get killed. And so she runs, runs to the door to let her in. And as soon as she does, as soon as she opens the door, the drill rings out. And then he slashes her neck with the drill. He's a true and she, artist. And she falls to the floor dead. Like yeah. talk about using your resources. Like yeah. he, 
He uses it in so many different ways. There, that, uh, to be able to like flick something that long and unwieldy and it slashes the neck like that, just, you know, he's, people should study him. He is a master of his art. <laughs> um, and what, what did you think of the kill? Just that. Uh, <laughs> was it a surprise? Were you surprised or were you like, oh, that's totally. I mean, I knew as soon as she opened that door, she was going to get it. But, you know, I that was a, that was a surprise one. He could have just gone straight, straight in the yeah. way it works, you know, but. It... <laughs> yeah. So now it's just Trish and Kim and they've barricaded themselves upstairs in uh, Trish's room. Mm -hmm. Valerie had gone around to the back to knock on the door. And so like Valerie's still fairly close by and she didn't hear the drill or the screaming or anything like that, you know? Um, so she goes around the back door and she sees Jeff's blood on the ground. But before she can realize what, she, what it is, uh, Courtney comes out and scares her. And she's like, ah, you know, there's, I can't see anything, you know, I can't find anybody. Let's go back to the front to look again. And it starts thundering. So again, it's just this cycle of like noise, going to check on the noise, checking in the front, checking in back, checking in the front. Like it's, it gets a bit repetitive and sluggish. Mm -hmm. so that's like, <laughs> uh, towards the middle and towards the end a little bit, you know, because there's only, I guess, so much you could do with like, I don't know. I I think it's been done. Separating and then putting noise over noise so you don't hear it. Yeah, there's there's definitely a bit too much of that. <laughs> yeah. So she knocks uh she knocks on the door and walks in. She's calling for the girls. Upstairs the girl hear her calling out, but they're scared to let her in. Trish says maybe she's friends with the killer. Maybe she knows the killer. And there's a musical sting here. Mm -hmm. And it's like wait are you we know that they're not friends like why are you like we're the only ones who can hear the music like who's yeah. that noise for i didn't notice it yeah. oh my gosh no i do need to see that again maybe i can find a clip yeah. <laughs> not have to watch the whole movie that is funny so next we um have a shot of them in the foreground and in the background we see thorn creeping in through the window with the drill i thought this was very effective yeah it was really cool um it's very like bob from twin peaks like especially in the jean jacket yes like, yeah. thank you <laughs> did we talk about on uh um people under the stairs about uh twin peaks like are you a twin peaks fan? yeah yeah, yeah. I, I hadn't the, seen the two it actors yeah no i loved i loved them being together and people under the stairs that was so great and she was the log lady and he was one of the she was um so it was nadine who is like the she becomes like a strong woman in twin peaks but they're oh, like oh oh yeah yeah he, she was one of the yeah. they're like married in the show but they have like issues and stuff like that okay yes yeah you're right you're right okay yeah okay i since then i've seen uh twin peaks so um yeah they're great yeah they're great so he goes and uh he grabs the the handle of the the drill and like slowly advances on him and it's pretty crazy look on his face so as he's advancing on them he gets closer and closer and the floor creaks and then the two girls slowly look behind them and they yell out when they see that it's the killer and they jump up and they start throwing things at him and then trish hits him in the back of the head with a bat which i love and he goes down immediately oh, and they <laughs> yes i was like get him get him again <laughs> she should have kept right yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> like do not stop until his head is crushed <laughs> yeah and uh, but they do take the opportunity to get out of the room he wakes up and um before kim can get out slashes her or no i think he stabs her or kim in the mm -hmm. gut and yeah, it's like her knife or something like that yeah so that's two people killed with uh, with a knife and then trish is like well sucks to be you and just like <laughs> takes that opportunity to get the fuck out of town so outside, Valerie is looking around the grounds. Like, this is getting ridiculous at this point. Like, she <laughs> hasn't heard anything. What is happening? She hasn't seen anything. <laughs> um, inside, Thorne is looking for Trish. 
um, he comes across a mirror and kind of looks at it a oh, bit yeah. weirdly. Did you notice that? I, yeah, I wrote his reflection. He's like, who am I? <laughs> it was so weird and like ponderous. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Val comes across uh, outside. Val comes across Courtney's body. And for a second, we're like, oh, man, is she okay? But she wakes up. She was just playing a prank. Basically, it's just them. The whole movie just hanging out. for pranks. Yeah. <laughs> Has she forgotten about like the blood that she saw? <laughs> yeah. And uh, so Valerie's like, "Oh, nobody's home. Let's just go and s- again check up front and see if there's anybody there, and then they'll leave." Uh, so inside, uh, Thorne is still looking for Trish. He's looking in a closet, but he wa- he doesn't see anything. He walks away, and she was in a garment bag. Right. Which, yeah. Which I thought I thought that was kind of yeah, cool. That's good. Yeah. So uh Courtney and Val finally uh, Valerie. I started just saying calling her Val because <laughs> we're on a first name basis. <laughs> yeah. Uh they go inside and uh Courtney's like, oh or Valerie's like, the party must have gone somewhere else. Courtney rants that, you know, well, for all our trouble, we should go ahead and raid the fridge. Oh my god. But Is Val says, well, yeah, let's just go. But in, in the process, um, Courtney had opened the fridge. And do you remember what happened here? Yeah, it's great. Like the body keeps like fall, kind of falling out and going back in. <laughs> yeah. It's really great. I loved it a lot. I mean, how deep is that fridge? But still like just a great visual gag. And actually, so Kim was, she was actually in there. It was an actual fridge. And then she just had her, whatever arm we can't see, I think it's the right arm, uh, grabbing a bar and then when the door is open she would just release her body oh, when everything was closed she would pull her body up <laughs> and uh, she said she she credited her experience as a gymnast with helping her do this over and over and over again um, because i mean the bits like that you can really see you know how this was written kind of like I mean, that that belongs in like a silly satire kind of movie. Like that's not a serious thing. Yeah. That happened. So like, and I, and I love that. I just wish like, I, like, I wish the killer like had more, like almost more silliness and stuff. Cause he's like right on the edge of being like completely laughable as a villain. Jessica, I want to lock you in right now for Slumber Party Massacre too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I guess we, yeah. <laughs> we got to do it. We got to forge ahead. <laughs> All right. So, but finally, uh, Courtney's like, oh, I just want to do it anyway. You know, she, so she wants to raid the fridge. She opens it up and that's when she finally sees that the dead body falls out. Um, it's Kim's body. She screams and run. Val's like, what, what's wrong? She goes to look and she sees it as well. She tries to run, but she sees the shadow of Thorne coming down the stairs. And she tells, um, tells Courtney to run, but she, she, she doesn't got they don't have very far or a long time to hide and the killer doesn't hear them apparently and so everyone um, is really like hard of hearing and yeah <laughs> um the, valerie hides in the basement stairwell and um thorn drags the or, or uh is still looking for for trish at that point courtney is hiding under the couch Thorne de- then drags the the dead pizza guy and throws him down the basement stairs at uh, because they had covered him with a with a sheet. Mm-hmm. So then what he does is he goes and lays where the dead body was and covers right. himself with the blanket, pretending to be the dead be- uh, pizza guy, which is kind of a cool thing yeah. if you think that your victims are trapped in the house with you and can't go anywhere. Yeah, but like the doors and the windows yeah, like, they're just going to come back in and be like well i don't see him anywhere let's continue eating pizza and twinkies yeah <laughs> which sounds like a great meal yeah yeah um so then trish comes out of hiding and suddenly we see Jan- uh, coach Jana arrives and she walks in she sees the body that's on the floor and she uncovers it and once she does thorn attacks her and um downstairs val is looking for a weapon and she finds a saw do you remember what happens with this saw oh i don't remember the saw she she finds a saw and it's a it's not a power saw it's like plugged in cord 
the oh, cord. That's right. She tries to run up with <laughs> Yes. Like that is so funny if you think of it in a satirical sense. Right. No. It would be so fucking funny, but also it's funny in this sense. Like it works both ways. You it know? definitely made me be like, okay, now I think you deserve to die. <laughs> Because <laughs> she thought that was gonna work, <laughs> and just the resolve she had, she's like, "Okay, I got this. Yeah. Let's do it." It just runs up, and it just ooh, gets it gave me up. that kind of like idle hands like feel, where like Seth Green, I think, has like a like a turkey a meat cutter kind of thing, and just like pulls it out of the the wall, and it stops working. I have I have been meaning to rewatch Idle Hands for years. I need to rewatch it, and I haven't seen it since it came out. Um. All right, so then Courtney, uh, so what Courtney does is Courtney trips Thorne and Coach stabs him repeatedly with the fire, I think it's Stoker or something like that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. And then Trish runs out and stabs him, but he stands up and he slices Coach in the abdomen with the drill again. Yeah. I think she was too close for that. We've already seen how much room he needs. Yeah, yeah. But I'm hoping that, well, I hope everybody survived but obviously i don't think i don't think he got it was a superficial step right like we didn't see guts pouring out or anything yeah like yeah i think she could have survived that also when she showed up i had no idea who it was because i needed the track suit <laughs> yes <laughs> I was yes like, this is another this is another 27 year old person coming to the party oh no it's the coach okay yeah I, she needed her sue sylvester track suit <laughs> the, uh, from glee is that yeah yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. So uh, downstairs in the uh, basement, Val, Valerie finally grabs a machete. And upstairs, we get some more shots of the dick drill. Like, he's just, like, posing with the drill as his dick above these oh. girls. <laughs> and then he says, the first lines he says in a movie, right. I believe, do, uh, he says, you're pretty. All of you are very pretty. I love you. It yeah. takes a lot of love for a person to do this. You know you want it. You love it. I don't even know you. So some of this I'm thinking is like things that toxic men would say to women. Like, you know, it it's takes like, a lot of love for a person to do this. Too? Like, yeah. <laughs> you have a lot of give to, a lot of love to give to a lot of people, my friend. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, you know, you want it. You know, it's like really in a context, it's kind of terrifying to hear. Like, oh, yeah, totally. Yeah. I still so, would have preferred the a drill pun at that time, though. If he was going to not say anything through the whole movie, I wanted the only thing for him to say to be a drill pun. <laughs> and probably like a, a really bad one, too. Like, drill yeah. you later. Or something. Yeah. <laughs> you ladies are getting drilled tonight. <laughs> So Valerie then runs up the stairs like I, I put here. You may not get this reference, but the, for the people who do, or I, I love you, but she runs up the stairs like Leroy Jenkins with the machete. Oh, and Leroy Jenkins! <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> with the machete and like shakes shakes it at him, right? Like just like doing one of these, but misses. And he runs and she like is charging at him outside, which I love that she is yeah. now the attacker, right? Yeah, she went at him like full chest, like it, but he, I, I was I was cheering for her. <laughs> she backs him up to the pool, and do you recall what happens here? Is this when she she gets his drill in hand? She slices <laughs> she <gets his> hand. <laughs> yeah, so she slices she she swings the machete and slices the drill bit in half. Which, oh, the drill bit. Okay, yeah, that's right. Yeah, the drill bit in half. Really there goes your manhood, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I he. I love how easy that was to break. Like all of the stuff that he did with that drill, like, and it was solid the whole time. And she just goes whack. And it's like doink. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's like, okay, I'm giving this movie way too much credit, but like, it's like when he's doing the killing, it's rock hard. Yeah. But mm -hmm. when like she's he's being attacked, is that yeah. Yep, yeah. nothing. Yep, mm hmm Yeah. Uh, so that she also cuts his hand off, which yep. that was gory, and that looked really, really cool. Yeah. Right? yeah. Um, she then slices his midsection, and he falls in the pool, and um, he's actually making Kool-Aid in the pool. Right? Yeah, there you go. No sugar <laughs> no, needed. No sugar needed. <laughs> she drops the machete, because of course, mm -hmm. and Courtney shows up, and then they hug. Then we, we see... Um, uh, Thorn pulling himself out from out of the water. One final lunge from him. He attacks Valerie. Courtney jumps on his back. 
he kind of beats her. Trish comes out and attacks him with the knife, but he slaps her away. Then he lunges at Valerie and basically falls on the machete. Yes. He dies. Uh, Val and it was like crying on the floor, like probably forever changed. Mm-hmm. Then the sounds of credits. I'm sorry, the sounds the of sirens. Then the credits. <laughs> <laughs> so what did you think of like the the choice of who gets to kill the person so at that point it could have been trish courtney uh or uh valerie and valerie is the one who ends up actually getting to kill kill them whereas do you feel like we're doing like dual leading ladies trish and valerie or do you feel it like it did feel like i i kept and again like i kept forgetting who was who yeah it was kind of this homogenized like 80s lady um to me in a way um but uh no i i kind of liked the who was gonna you know who was gonna fight it i like that you know we had the the sisters kind of and Valerie was the one with the with Courtney and is, is she the sister and yeah. they have their own separate house. Yeah, I like that it was like the outsiders to the party kind okay. of end up being the ones. Um, even though that is that is a little strange because they spent half of the time just being like, oh, let's try the front door. Oh, let's try the back door. Let's try, the, you know. Yeah, what's the, what's that noise? What's that? Noise? Yeah. Um, so I'm a, yeah, it's it, I guess it's a little bit of a bummer that no one from the actual party that was getting like actively stalked and murdered ended up like being the the victor in that sense but you know as long as he got it from someone <laughs> okay <Yeah. laughs> and i i like that he got like multiply like messed up you know he got the hand and the, the stomach and you know he got hit with a baseball bat and he got coach stabbed and so he's a resilient yeah. guy i like that they all uh, well towards like the end yeah, like you're saying, a lot of them got their licks in, which was yeah. which was cool. So, yeah. all right, so that's the end of the movie. Now we're gonna rate it in a second, but I just wanted to know, in general, what did you think of Slumber, the Slumber Party Massacre? Um, I mean, if I didn't, if I didn't know that it was written as like a satire, um, I I'm not sure I would have enjoyed it as much. Mm-hmm. That definitely gives it a little bit of a a commentary that I don't think is super obvious. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of like all over, all over the map for me because I feel like there's very like serious things. And then I feel there's, you know, there's very goofy gags and things that are very obviously like nonchalant, like girls eating pizza off a corpse, um, love it. <laughs> you know, which I, I love that stuff, but yeah, it was, it was kind of just a little all over the place. There really wasn't much story yeah as far as like we don't really know who these characters are except that they're comfortable being topless around each other they really care about the score to a baseball game um (laughs) (laughs) and that's that's about and then they're like mean to each other like high school girls are but yeah there really wasn't much of a story i i definitely um i'm not sure yeah i'm not sure i would need to watch it again but i am eagerly uh anticipating the second one yeah, so I think I kind of agree with you. I think if this would had been written and directed by uh, a man, uh, I don't think this would have been as enjoyable. Yeah. And I think I probably would have hated it because it would have been more gratuitous nudity, probably. Right. Yeah. Like uh, uh, the director, um, Amy Holden Jones, was saying that um, the, the producer um, wanted the nudity and it needed to be in the movie, right? Mm-hmm. But she tried to film it in the most non-sexual way possible just checking the boxes okay here's some scenes of butts here's some scenes of tits Uh and and while they're still there and obviously they're it's like sexual parts and all that maybe maybe that's a blessing i don't know but it's it's definitely not as gratuitous as a lot of the movies in this era that i've seen Yeah. yeah It was, it, it did make me feel more of that. Like, it's just focusing on a butt, but it's not, it's like almost just kind of silly where it's just like, and here's a butt. Yeah. Just you want, you want this, right? Here's your butt shot. Can we move butt. on? <laughs> yeah. Can we move on? Everybody cool? Okay. Cool. Here's the next butt. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but you know, it, some of the dialogue was great. The, was watching this filtered through so many lenses, like, mm-hmm. Roger Corman's lens, the writer's lens, the director's lens, all that sort of stuff really makes for a muddled but really interesting 
movie. So, you know, I did enjoy it for what, for what it was. So I'm let's go ahead. Watching. Yeah, definitely. So let's go ahead and go into ratings. We do rate out of five upside down crosses, five <laughs> being the best movie you've ever seen and one uh, being the worst, or you can even get a 0. 0.5, yeah. you know, 0. 0.2, whatever, whatever matters. So for you, what would you give the Slumber Party Massacre from 1982? I would give it a two out of five. Okay, that's fair. Yeah, <laughs> I it just sucks because I really there are moments that I think are like are really really cute. They just don't belong in this movie. I feel like. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so for me, I'm not too far off from you. For our rating systems are possibly a, a little bit different because for me, two point five is a really bad movie, and maybe mm-hmm. you think it's a really bad movie. That, that's fine, but I'm just saying for me, two point five is a really bad movie. So what I'm, I, 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 it's slightly better than a really bad movie. It's a like a fun movie. So mm-hmm. for me, it's like three. Like three is like a C, C minus sort of thing for me. Okay. Um, just, and sometimes it makes sense. I don't think it's a horrible bad. movie at all. You know. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's just I for me like what I what I consider like a a good movie is something that I rewatch right yeah. a, a lot, and this is definitely one where I'm like, okay, I saw that. <laughs> yeah, I, I I can see that. Um, but I mean, but I, I I I like I said, like I think that there are some things from this movie that I I think are you know better than other movies that I've seen in in this genre in this kind of home invasion girly movie genre um i yeah i think the only thing that's really lacking for me is any kind of like characterization outside of we're high school girls and boys and apparently baseball game scores and basketball playing and basketball playing basketball while watching baseball (laughs) in our in our lingerie (laughs) so that for, for me that was three upside down crosses for you was two two upside down crosses yeah. um so what we do next is uh request a movie in a similar vein to this one one you'd recommend like i said uh maybe that you would do as a top a double bill yeah so okay. do you have one or, or i go first which if you need time unless would, you already have one already i mean i think one movie that i kind of like in this genre in kind of a different kind of way is bodies 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 very, okay I, very I, recent like now, 2019 yeah. or something yeah, I mean, it's just, it's kind of the same where we're in a house, hijinks are happening. Certainly it's not a, a big, uh, predominantly female cast, but it's mostly, I think. I think there's only like two guys in the in the group um, and they get taken out pretty quickly, I think. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's definitely, we're not talking about, it's more of a, I, yeah, I don't want to give anything away, but um, a supposed like killer on the loose. Yeah. And, just kind of figuring out what's going there so that's that yeah that would be mine in this vein kind of movie okay cool and for me i'm gonna say slumber party massacre too <laughs> <There you go. laughs> I def- just it's just a great double bill so yeah. one and okay. two right. and uh i'm not i'm not gonna do the thing where i get you recorded saying you're gonna do slumber party massacre too with me <laughs> but we'll definitely talk because i think it would be so much fun to have you back on. I know because, my husband would be excited to watch it again. Yeah, because I, I know it's another <laughs> it's another written and directed by a woman movie as well. So okay, so, no, I'm uh, so Amy Holden doesn't come back for that one, but uh, 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 it is written and directed by Deborah Brock. So that would be my recommendation. So um, Jessica and I are going to continue our conversations in, on the Sunday School Sessions, which is a Patreon exclusive show for everybody. If you'd like to support the show. Uh, patreon.com slash my horror confessional in the meantime jessica i wanted to say thank you so much for coming on again the second time you're on and you're so much fun to talk to you and you, you pick great movies and uh yeah thank you so much if you could please let everybody know once again how they could follow you how they could support you uh where they could see you in a couple weeks that sort of thing yeah absolutely thank you again for having me so much have, having me on it's it's always so fun to watch movies that i haven't seen before um, especially horror movies, because I feel like I didn't get um, a lot of exposure to this sort of kind of uh, B movie. No, I don't know if it just count as a B movie. I don't know. Not really. Low kind of cult, I, cult film. Favorite. Yeah, it's definitely a cult movie. Yeah. Um, so I know it's great to be able to watch it. Um, yeah, so I am going to be at the Ghoulish Book Festival in just a couple of weeks. So if you're in San Antonio area, you can you can catch me there. I'm going to be doing uh, readings, or I have a reading. I'm going to be on panels. I'm going to have a table there. I'm going to be doing a blackout poetry workshop, which is going to be really fun um, after that flight. 
Oh. <laughs> it's a really interesting day, I think. Um, you can find me online at mcuniverse.com. I'm at the Jess McHugh at all the places. Um, I'm also going to be at AuthorCon this year in Williamsburg. That's in April. I think it's like two weeks after uh, Ghoulish. So I'll be there as well. And uh, who knows what the rest of the year holds. <laughs> Very cool. Well, thank you uh, once again for uh, uh, joining me today. And thank you, everybody, for listening. And we will talk to you next time. Spooky, die spooky!